Hello and welcome guys. This is the Immortal in Marvel. Don't forget to go and support the original author OVERLORD1103. Make yourselves comfortable and enjoy. Chapter 26. On the other side, after confirming that there were no other ambushes or pursuers, Derek parked the motorcycle in a secluded corner. He let out a deep breath trying to calm his racing heart and slow down his breathing. Time seemed to return to its normal pace and his body temperature gradually decreased. However, he was suddenly overwhelmed by a wave of fatigue, and his legs gave out, causing him to collapse to the ground. The powerful ability of bullet time, which had made him invincible, was not without its own set of side effects. If it was only used for a short duration, it would not be dangerous, but if Derek wanted to maintain the bullet time for a long time, his body must bear a super intensive load. If he was a normal person with a slightly weaker physique, it would either be heart failure or cerebral congestion. For Derek, who maintained the bullet time for several minutes, his body organs had already been overwhelmed. So after the bullet time was released and the excitement of adrenaline was removed, the feeling of death came flooding up. It's just that, while the body's organs were failing, a wave of heat was also quickly repairing the damage to Derek's organs. Seeing Derek collapse suddenly, Frank dragged his injured body and hurriedly checked him. Finding that Derek had just passed out, he carried Derek onto his shoulder with his uninjured arm and quickly left the scene. Two hours later, in a hut in some remote area, Frank had applied some aids and operated on his wound skillfully. After putting on his clothes, Frank walked out of the hall and looked at Derek who was holding a gatling and making strange noises. Seeing his lively appearance once again, Frank didn't feel too weak. Frank came to Derek in a few steps and said, This is not a toy for you. Put it down. Don't be so stingy. I'm your savior, old man. Derek said, but looking at Frank, he reluctantly let go of gatling. Frank's safe house was the best, with all kinds of firearms and weapons, even heavy fire weapons such as gatling and bazooka and stock. It was simply a small arsenal. Derek, who now had the talent of a super high school sharpshooter, could easily distinguish various types of firearms and configurations. He could see that Frank's weapons have been carefully modified, including the Browning automatic pistol. However, Derek had a strong feeling that he also would be able to modify firearms. He couldn't wait to find a gun to try at once. Hearing Derek's words, Frank twitched. Whose fault do you think this all was? If Derek hadn't implicated him, he would have escaped in peace. Derek looked at Frank, the tough guy who was shot, but still full of energy. He then said with some doubt, Well, why don't you tell me the truth, then? Have you participated in transformation experiments before, such as the Super Soldier Project or something? That's Captain America, not me. Frank was sullen. Captain America was no secret to the world. There was also the Captain America Museum in New York, which contained all the records of Captain America's deeds, as well as his brotherly love and hatred for Bucky. Then it doesn't make sense, Derek muttered softly. To him, Frank's physique seemed a bit inhuman. Frank didn't bother with these boring topics and said in a deep voice, I'll tell you one thing, we are in big trouble. The Russian Ross gang is looking for our whereabouts everywhere, and has issued a high reward for us in the underworld. It seems that they don't want to let us go like this. Derek was taken aback. Is it because I messed up their deal? No, it's because you killed the leader, Vladimir's younger brother Anatoly. Ah, I see Derek was very surprised. He thought about it carefully. Could it be that the Russian man who was acting as their leader during the deal was Anatoly? No wonder the group of gangsters pursued us so persistently. However, Frank continued, It's not over yet. There is another wave of people who also issued a bounty to us. The bounty is not as big as the Russian Ross gangs, but it is enough to attract the attention of many people. Who even are they? They were the trading partners of the Russian Ross gang. The person in charge was called Kharki, who is a well-known leader of a drug dealer organization. But as far as I know, Kaki recently found a backer, and now he is working for Harold Howard. F parenthesis dot author's note. I hope it's the correct alias. Wait there's Kingpin here. Derek was a little confused when he heard his name. Harold Howard, the alias used by Kingpin, Marvel's famous villain. He was the biggest leader of New York's underground forces, in terms of both strength and influence, Kingpin was an equivalent of Mount Tai. The commission that Derek accepted was to disrupt an illegal transaction of a group of gangsters. 
But the problem was that the information provided only showed that the Russian Ross gang and a drug dealer organization were involved in this transaction. But the people in charge of this transaction were not mentioned. How would have Derek known that one party was the relative of the leader of the Russian Ross gang and the other was Kingpin's subordinate? Now, due to a lack of information, he had to face the bounty offered by Kingpin and the Russian Ross gang at the same time. Chapter 27 How much is the reward on our heads? Harold gave 5 million, and the Russian Ross gang gave 10 million. As long as we are caught, the killer can get a total of 15 million United States dollars. This is a wave of big loss. What loss? Frank frowned. I'm talking about the commission I accepted. The employer's request was to destroy the drug trade of the Russian Ross gang. I thought it was an ordinary gang deal. But I never expected this shit. In the end, I offended both the Russian Ross gang and King Harold. Derek said with a somewhat depressed expression. The most outrageous thing is that the reward for my commission was only a mere 100,000 United States dollars. And the reward on my head in exchange for it went in millions. Frank looked at Derek expressionlessly. Although they hadn't been in contact for a long time, he doesn't feel that Derek has anything to do with the word wary. Derek revealed the whole situation to Frank with nothing hidden. To him, a stranger he just met, that too, in a suspicious area. Ignoring Derek's ugly face that only cared about money, Frank slowly said, an important member of the Ross gang in Russia trades drugs with Kingpin's subordinates, but the employer can easily know where they are trading. There was a problem with this commission. After pondering for a moment, Frank suddenly came to an unexpected conclusion. Hearing this, Derek was thoughtful. This commission really is not right. Back then, I had to travel all over New York by car to find a gangster. But this time it was easy to find the place of commission. It was a little too smooth. It feels like someone dug a hole to lure me into it on purpose. Frank said calmly, I'm afraid this commission wasn't aimed at you. But just happened to be found by you. You mean, someone is using this? Frank nodded and asked, Who is your employer? I don't know. The employer's information is confidential. Maybe I can find some clues after I go back. Under Frank's constant reminders, the more Derek thought about it, the more he felt that this commission was weird. Originally, he just wanted to unlock the achievement, but when he saw that it was a gangster's drug trade, he accepted the commission for a little bit of extra money he might get. But now he found that this commission seemed to be a deep dark pit waiting for someone to jump into it. Derek was now going to go back and ask Weasel about the commission. Speaking of this, Derek looked at Frank and asked, By the way, why did you come there? Frank was silent and did not answer Derek's question. Derek immediately became unhappy. This is a bit bad, old man. I answered everything you asked. But you don't even answer such a normal question. I thought we were comrades and I even saved your life. Frank was silent for a while and finally said, Kaki was my target. But you killed him. It was a coincidence indeed. Derek was commissioned to be there, and Frank too had his own goals tonight. That is to kill Kaki, the leader of the drug trafficking organization. If Derek didn't show up tonight, Frank would have still taken action to turn Kaki's body cold. With his style, he would definitely not let go of the other gangsters either, and the ending would probably be no different from now. Even without Derek's help, Frank would have been able to survive somehow with just some more injuries. I see. Derek nodded. By the way, I still don't know your name. My name is Derek, and I'm an ordinary migrant worker. Frank. Frank replied coldly, I've answered your questions. You should leave now. You'd better find a place where no one will find you and hide. Why hide? Did you not understand what I just told you? Rewards have been offered to our heads. As long as you show your face in the open, they will find you again soon. Derek touched his face and asked, Are you sure they can recognize me? Frank was speechless. For most Westerners, Asian faces were hard to distinguish. If two Asians were not put together, the difference in their appearance was unrecognizable. This was a natural camouflage and a genetic advantage he had. Besides, wasn't there a reward for your head too? Are you planning to hide? It's better for them to find me so that I don't need to waste my time looking for them, Frank said coldly. If he was afraid of being exposed, he would not go to fight criminals with nothing to disguise himself. Feeling the strong killing intent Frank was emanating, 
Derek knew that he was worrying over nothing. This man probably wishes that the criminals would come to his door by himself. After all, he's the one who knocks in the end, Derek thought. He then stood up, found a pen and paper, and wrote down a number. All right, if you need any help, just call me. After speaking, Derek left the room. Before leaving, he took a reluctant look at Gatling. Seeing that Frank was vigilant, he was afraid that this guy would suddenly run out with Gatling in his arms, if he tried to take it which was his original intention. Chapter 28 A gentleman in a suit and leather shoes, pushed open the door to a dimly lit room. He ignored the heavily armed Russians inside and walked in slowly. At the far end of the room stood a short head Russian man, staring at a charred corpse on the table with a dazed expression. The gentleman glanced at the corpse and spoke calmly. Vladimir, please accept my employer's condolences for your loss. He deeply regrets the departure of your brother. However, there are some matters we still need to discuss. After a few seconds, Vladimir turned to face the gentleman. If Kingpin wants to talk, he should come here himself instead of sending an assistant, he said. Unfortunately, my employer cannot come in person at the moment due to some issues. However, he has given me full authority to handle this matter on his behalf. You can trust me to act in his best interests, the gentleman replied, maintaining his composure. Vladimir stepped forward, his eyes glinting with a cold light. He approached the gentleman with a menacing aura resembling a brown bear full of gnawing anger. I said, Fisk should come here himself, and not send one of his dogs to talk with me. He snarled. The man narrowed his eyes but kept his tone calm. Please refrain from using that name here, he said. Vladimir sneered. Oh, you mean Kingpin or Wilson Fisk? What should I not call him? Aren't they both the same? He taunted. Vladimir's eyes turned colder, and he glared at the man with cruelty dripping from his face. As the leader of the Russian Ross gang, he feared no one, not even Kingpin, who had gained widespread notoriety. He jabbed his fingers hard into the man's chest, using his immense strength to push him back several steps. Your name is Wesley, right? You tell Fisk that if he wants to talk, he should come to me himself. Tell him not to use this perfunctory attitude. He growled. Despite being treated this way by Vladimir, Wesley remained calm and nonchalantly straightened his collar. Wesley's expression remained calm as he spoke. Since you're not interested in discussing business affairs, let's talk about personal matters. He said, regarding the two attackers who blew up the warehouse, my employer has dispatched investigators to identify one of the assailants. I believe we will be able to follow the leads and track down the other attacker very soon. Vladimir took a sudden step forward and glared at Wesley in disbelief. What did you say? Tell me, who is that damned attacker? He demanded. Wesley acknowledged Vladimir's anger. I understand why you're upset. We also suffered significant losses in terms of personnel and goods. You're not the only one who wants to find the attackers. Without answering Vladimir's question, Wesley continued speaking. You need to learn to control your anger. I know your brother's death has deeply affected you, but some things cannot be avoided. Madam Gal has been informed about your brother's death, and she's concerned that you may lack a strong support system which could negatively impact the business. There are some jobs that you may not be able to handle competently anymore for her, he revealed. Vladimir fought to control his eagerness to learn more about the attackers. Why wasn't I informed about this earlier? We were discussing it in private, Wesley explained. Wesley then smiled slightly. Fortunately, my employer is willing to assist you in regaining your footing. For example, we could provide additional services to support you in some missions he offered. Vladimir's expression turned defensive as he asked warily, Is Fisk trying to take over my job? Before Wesley could finish speaking, Vladimir concluded their real purpose. Madam Gal, Kingpin and the two Ross brothers, Vladimir and Anatoly. They were all gang leaders from Hell's Kitchen, but they did not fight with each other. They chose to join forces to carry out criminal activities, each completing a different set of tasks to achieve non-conflict and uniform distribution of interests. In this, Vladimir and Anatoly are mainly responsible for the transportation of goods. Wesley was right about one thing though. Because they were two people, Vladimir and Anatoly were able to jointly manage more sites. Now that Anatoly was dead, the site managed by him had temporarily become unmanaged, seriously affecting the common interests of their gang alliance. From Vladimir's point of view, Kingpin just took a fancy to the territory led by his younger brother. What assistance? He clearly wanted to take over Anatoly's transportation work, 
undoubtedly trying to damage the Russian Ross gang. Wesley didn't deny it and said with a smile, this is only for the common interests of everyone. It is beneficial for both parties. Fuck the benefits. Vladimir roared with anger on his face. Fisk's greed is too big. He wants to take away half of my territory. Go and tell Fisk this is impossible. Don't try to threaten me with information about those two attackers. I don't need his help to find those two damn shits. Wesley took out a white handkerchief and wiped the spit from Vladimir's face. I hope you will seriously consider it. My employer is waiting for your reply. Wesley said as he turned around. A hey. while later. After a knock on a large wooden door, Wesley walked into an office. He looked at the huge man sitting behind the desk and reported respectfully. Vladimir did not agree, but his hatred for the two attackers is very deep. Under the bright light, there was a fat man nearly two meters tall, wearing a custom-made high-end suit. His build was huge but not round. With that friendly expression he wore on his face, people who don't know him would think that he is a kind and ordinary businessman. And the same was true on the surface. He was the famous philanthropist Wilson Fisk. He once donated a large sum of money for the construction of New York and declared that he hoped to give New York the peace it never had. Ironically, however, the philanthropist had a little secret identity. He was also known as Kingpin, the master of Hell's Kitchen. Chapter 29 Deepest desires often breed extreme hatred. Conversely, extreme hatred arises from deeply rooted desires. And Vladimir is no exception to this. Kingpin explained as he stood tall, his back against Wesley. His eyes stared out of the window, overlooking the bustling New York below him like a king looking over his kingdom. Shaking the red wine in his hand, Kingpin said, sooner or later, Vladimir's hatred will pull him into the abyss. What we have to do now is to wait patiently. We don't need to talk to him again. Soon, he will beg us for help himself. His tone was very calm. No one could question the weight of the words in any way. Kingpin was born into a gangster family in Hell's Kitchen. He was abused by his father when he was young. His scarred childhood made him even more eager for the right to life and death. Kingpin was able to walk to the end of the current criminal road, because he broke through bloody fights and challenges one by one. Those who questioned him became one of the many corpses on his road to the peak. I see. Wesley nodded, and a glimmer of light flashed through his glasses. There is one more thing I need to report to you. It is about the two warehouse attackers. The people we sent secretly sent us some information. Is their identity confirmed? Kingpin unconsciously touched the cuff button on his right hand. After investigation, one of them was found to be a recently well-known criminal killer. Some people call him the Punisher, who hunts and kills criminals. There is no relevant record of his identity information. It may take a lot of time to find out about his whereabouts. Quote, As for the other attacker, his situation is quite special. Speaking of this, Wesley paused for a moment. He didn't know how to explain the rest to Kingpin. Go on. Sensing Kingpin's displeasure, Wesley immediately said, Our people have seen the face of that mercenary. It is said that he is an Asian, but all their statements are a little different. Wesley's expression looked strange. Some people said that the man came from a distant oriental country. Some said he was a migrant worker. And a small group said he was the famous movie star, Jackie Chan. All of them sounded very sure of their ideas. Hearing these words, even Kingpin, a well-informed underworld boss, was a little speechless. Why would Jackie Chan quit making movies and become a mercenary? Kingpin was completely speechless. He looked at Wesley and asked as the employer, Can't you know the identity of the employee? Wesley shook his head and continued, I'm afraid not. The commission we issued was carried out on the dark web, and the information of both parties was completely confidential. The only thing that can be determined is that there was only one person who accepted the commission. The Punisher guide just appeared there like a variable. It seems that the person who accepted the entrustment is also not someone ordinary. Originally, we just wanted to find a completely innocent outsider to disrupt the transaction with the Russian Ross gang. After secretly eliminating Anatoly and Kharki, all the blame would be put on the guy's head. Kingpin spoke slowly, with an imperceptible amount of surprise in his eyes. Unexpectedly, this person had the ability to eliminate all men at once. Our people had no chance to make a move. What surprises me even more is that the people sent by Vladimir not only failed to stop them, but also they all died. The employer of Derek's entrustment was the New York Underworld's Kingpin. 
It was also due to this reason that Derek's commission went so smoothly. That is how he knew the exact location of the drug deal. Although Kaki had just started working for him, Kingpin did not trust him at all. Moreover, only after the death of Kaki, the leader of the drug trafficking organization, could Kingpin annex Kaki's drug trafficking organization and completely turn Kaki's power into his own. But, compared with this, Kingpin had a larger vision in the longer term. What he really wanted was the transportation job of the Russian Ross gang and their land. As long as he could take over all the transportation jobs, his power could expand again later. Kingpin was not nervous about Vladimir suspecting his plan at all. After all, in everyone's eyes, his men and goods were lost too, and he has also issued a reward, perfectly portraying himself as a victim alongside Vladimir. And, all the anger accumulated by Vladimir would be vented on the murderer who killed Anatoly in the end. Once Vladimir kills the murderer, all the truth and shreds of evidence behind this plan, would be buried forever. This is all a part of Kingpin's plan. His planning ability and cruelty were enough to make people feel chills. However, there were huge numbers of loopholes in this perfect plan too. That is, the warehouse attacker wasn't caught and still roamed freely. Moreover, the other party also escaped from Vladimir's pursuit, and even the people Kingpin secretly arranged, failed to take action to stop him. Kingpin was lost in his thoughts. No one knew what he was thinking. After a long time, Kingpin said again, Wesley, tell Vladimir the identity of the Punisher. Let the Punisher restrain Vladimir for now. Also, do everything possible to find the person who accepted our commission. Kill him as soon as you find him. Chapter 30 Weasel, get me a cappuccino. Derek, wearing glasses, sat at the bar in Sister Margaret's and called out to Weasel, who was busy cleaning glasses. Weasel looked up and noticed the change in Derek's appearance. He couldn't help but wonder, are you somehow Marpic and kept it a secret? No. Derek pushed his glasses and explained solemnly, this is just my perfect disguise. Weasel was speechless, do you think you are Superman? Is wearing glasses a disguise? You don't believe my skill. Derek was not happy, his perfect disguise was questioned after all. Nonsense, if this can be called a disguise, wouldn't a woman be required to get a plastic surgery every time they want to use makeup? Weasel's voice was a little uncontrollable, and suddenly found the long-haired woman standing on the right side of the bar staring at him. He then said embarrassingly, Oh, oh, Vanessa, this is just a metaphor. I have no ill will towards women who wear makeup. Vanessa. Derek turned his head and glanced at the long-haired woman standing nearby. It turned out that she was the girlfriend Wade had been walking about all along. But it seemed like Vanessa didn't know that Wade was still alive, and Wade also hid himself, scared of meeting her with his new face. Derek turned his attention back to Weasel and spoke with confidence. If you still don't believe me, how about we make a bet? I bet that my disguise is foolproof, and as proof of my confidence, I offer this cappuccino as my wager. Yes, alright, but how do you complete this bed? Weasel became interested. Derek looked around and then saw a bearded man passing by. Hey Buck. The bearded man heard someone calling his name, and looked at Derek suspiciously. Who are you? Do we know each other? It's me, Derek said as he took off his glasses. It turned out to be you, Rice Guy. I almost didn't recognize you. How have you been? Dot 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 dot. Weasel was speechless, standing behind the bar. If he remembered correctly, Derek and Buck seemed to have met each other a few days ago. Well, I admit that this is a disguise. But I can't deny that Buck is indeed a little blind either. Weasel took out his precious coffee powder with some distress, and made a perfect cup of cappuccino for Derek. Putting the coffee in front of Derek, Weasel handed out a black card at the same time and jokingly said, Now now, your popularity is very high, Mr. 15 million. I can't help but be tempted by this. Derek picked up the black card and found that the content on it was actually about himself. Targets. The Punisher and an unidentified Asian. Contents of the commission. Two people sabotaged the important deal between the Scorpion organization and the Russian Ross gang. One of them is the Punisher the criminal killer, and the other is an unknown Asian, suspected to be Jackie Chan, no confirmation yet. Killing or capturing the two can get 15 million US dollars. Information, according to the degree of effectiveness to give a part of the reward. Right brace. 
The information on this reward has just been updated. I didn't expect you to be related to the Punisher. As an information dealer, Weasel naturally knew the famous deeds of Frank. It was an accident, bruh. Derek didn't expect that Frank's identity would be exposed before him. In other words, now Frank was facing the threat of all the bounties alone, which was equivalent to standing in the eye of the storm. The temptation of 15 million United States dollars was very big. There was no idea how many beasts this would attract. Derek took a sip of coffee and asked Weasel, Has the investigation about what I asked started? Weasel nodded. You're right. There seems to be a problem with that commission. Upon further investigation, I discovered that the frozen warehouse was rented just two weeks ago. It's likely a temporary trading location. Other than the person in charge of the transaction that night, there should not have been more than a few people who knew about it in advance. So, my employer is one of the insiders. Yes. Weasel scanned the bar and confirmed that no one was paying attention to him. He then lowered his voice and said, According to my guess, this employer is likely to be someone higher up in Hell's Kitchen. Derek frowned. Him, the other gang's backer was Kingpin. Wait a minute. You mean it's either Kingpin or the leader of Russia's Ross gangs? I heard that the leader of the Ross gang was going crazy. Searching the city for the whereabouts of the Punisher but there seems to be no movement from the other side. It was obvious enough what Weasel meant and what he had concluded. Derek's face contorted with disbelief. Kingpin was my employer. He exclaimed, his mind racing with the implications of this revelation. This is just my guess. But, if this is indeed the case, I advise you to try not to show your face. Kingpin is not a very kind person. He is much crueler and stronger than you can imagine. Although Weasel knows that Derek was special and has the same healing ability as Wade. The thing was, his combat experience was non-existent. He could only deal with some small-time gangsters. Derek pushed his glasses again and said solemnly, Just trust my disguise. Weasel was once again speechless. Weasel looked at Derek with an expression that conveyed his frustration with having to answer the same question repeatedly. To be honest, judging by the fact that there is no information about Derek in the bounty, it's safe to say that his disguise really is exceptionally well done. Weasel then leaned back and returned to his normal tone. However, your commission is considered to be completed, a total of 100,000 United States dollars. Do you want to convert it into cash? No, I'll exchange it all. Derek drank the rest of the coffee in one gulp, and then took out a list from his pocket. I want to buy the above items, deduct the cost from my money. Weasel glanced at the list and quickly saw the key points which made him very surprised. Do you know how to modify guns? I understand them a little. Chapter 31 The following day, Derek purchased a batch of guns and tools from Weasel. From then on, he began to modify the arms himself. As Derek began to modify the arms, his innate talent as a super high school level sharpshooter was activated once again. It was as if a switch had been flipped, and a sense of familiarity washed over him like an instinctual wave. Without even realizing it, he was able to effortlessly distinguish the functions of firearm accessories, while a multitude of values and specs flooded his mind. With all this assistance, Derek soon modified the first pistol. The modified pistol's power was more than double that of ordinary pistols, yet miraculously, the recoil remained unchanged. In stark contrast to Frank's modified Browning automatic pistol, which was undeniably powerful but had a jaw-dropping recoil, Derek's modified pistol was a work of art. If it weren't for his extraordinary physique, Frank would have never been able to use his pistol perfectly. Derek did not keep the pistol for long, and disassembled it and rebuilt it again in another way. As Derek continued to make modifications to the pistol, he tapped deeper into his super high school level sharpshooter's potential. With each new modification, his skills grew exponentially. It was as if his experience was visible to the naked eye, as his speed and precision improved rapidly. The instinctual familiarity he once felt with firearms, had now evolved into a substantial expertise. Through his experiences, Derek gained a new understanding of what it meant to possess such a super high school level talent. Derek realized that super high school level talent was not something that could be forced or implanted into the body. Rather, it was more like a natural ability and instinct that could be honed and perfected through dedicated practice and hard work. He understood that to fully integrate the theories and skills associated with his talent, he would need to put in countless hours of training and disciplined hard work. Five days later, Derek went to an open field in the suburbs. 
I have to admit it, America does have an advantage. There is no shortage of land here. In some places, it's even hard to find a living person, like in a graveyard. Derek surveyed the empty field before him, scanning the area to ensure that there was no one within a hundred meters of him. Satisfied that he was alone, he lowered his hands and suddenly two pistols appeared in his grasp. These were no ordinary firearms, but rather ones that had been outfitted with specialized propelling devices that Derek had built and concealed within his clothing. Derek's pupils shrank suddenly. His body was constantly secreting adrenaline, and his brain was functioning rapidly to calculate everything. Centering on his own body, using the prototype geometry as the plane of reference, constructing a statistical model in his mind, and the trajectory angles and distances of all attack points in front of his eyes. F parenthesis dot author's note. Damn, I should have studied. Suddenly, Derek straightened both his arms horizontally, and pointed to the left and right sides as the muzzles of the guns erupted with flames. Bang 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 bang. The muffled gunshots sounded simultaneous. They didn't sound like pistols, but more like two machine guns. With the sound of the gunshots, Derek turned his body and quickly swung his arms. This time it was not an arc's trajectory, but a more straight and direct attack. Although the speed is fast, it was not messy, and Derek's movements were also flowing smoothly. When the last bullet was fired from the gun, Derek flipped his wrist and the magazine fell down. The device in his clothes instantly ejected a new magazine and inserted it into the pistol. Bullets were ejected from the muzzle again, as there was not a single pause between the shots. After more than 10 seconds, Derek's pupils returned to their normal size as he exited bullet time. Panting slightly, he murmured, damn tiring shit. This was the second time Derek has entered bullet time till now. In bullet time, Derek could perform complex calculations and analyze everything in a short period. Each bullet was shot after doing precise calculations, and the hit rate was close to 100. Most of his shots were one shot one kill. He never needed to fire a second bullet at the same target. Coupled with the two pistols he personally modified, although his strength didn't increase much, but the shooting pace was highly increased. Fun fact, people die when they are killed. If people refuse the option of becoming stronger, the threat of the enemy increases, which might end up killing them. Gunfighting techniques plus firearms modification. This was the perfect method to utilize the super high school level sharpshooter talent perfectly. After finishing the test, Derek put the pistols back in his sleeve and walked to his home. While passing by a deserted construction site, Derek accidentally saw two figures, one big and one small standing inside. They looked like father and daughter to Derek when he saw the way they talked to each other. Before Derek could take a closer look at them, he saw the man, who seemed to be her father, suddenly raise a pistol and point it at the cute little girl. F parenthesis dot author's note. There is no loli in this FF. Just saying, liking lolis is pedo IMO. What the hell? Derek's pupils shrank again as time instantly slowed down. A pistol slipped from his sleeve as Derek swung his arm. While this was happening, the man pulled the trigger and shot a bullet at the little girl. Derek too, quickly pulled the trigger as a bullet raced out from the muzzle. It formed an arc in the air and intercepted the bullet shot by the man in between. From the perspective of the father and daughter, the father shot at the little one and the little one closed her eyes subconsciously. There was only a crisp sound. But the pain she imagined did not appear. The little girl slowly opened her eyes only to see her father standing there with a dull expression on his face. She wondered, Big Daddy, what's the matter? Her father didn't answer her, but stared at the two bullets on the ground dumbfounded. According to the angle and their structure formed right now, it seems like someone shot from the side, perfectly hitting the bullet that was traveling in a straight line midair. But the problem for Big Daddy right now was that their left and right sides were both covered with obstacles. So, the bullet could not reach them unless someone curved its trajectory in the air. Chapter 32 What are you doing in broad daylight? A voice suddenly came from behind. Big Daddy immediately turned around and saw Derek pointing a gun at his head. He fired that shot. Big Daddy was shocked. Although he couldn't believe it, the situation was right in front of his eyes. Someone shot and intercepted his bullet. But what was more shocking was that the other person was behind him all the time. Big Daddy. Seeing Daddy being pointed at the head, the young girl hurried over. The young girl, who appeared to be only about 11 years old, 
stood a short distance away from him. Despite facing him with a gun in his hand, she displayed no fear on her face. Instead, she exuded an aura of ferocity and fearlessness that belied her young age. She regarded Derek as an enemy, and assumed a combat-ready posture to face Derek head-on. Mindy, stand behind me. Big Daddy stopped her, stretched out his hand to protect her, and then used his body to block the muzzle of the gun. He stared at Derek intently. Who are you and what do you want? Seeing this situation, Derek frowned. Wasn't I brave trying to protect her? How did I become the bad one here? Derek then looked at Big Daddy and Mindy and suddenly noticed that Mindy was wearing a small body armor, as if she had known in advance that she would be shot, and took some measures to defend herself. Is the relation between you two that of a father and daughter? Big Daddy nodded with an ugly face, holding the pistol tightly in his right hand, but he didn't dare to lift it up. This person in front of him gave him an extremely dangerous feeling. He felt as if the muzzle of the gun was locked in on his head. No matter how he tried to avoid it, he couldn't escape. The most important thing was that Mindy was right behind him. He couldn't gamble with Mindy's safety. Well, it looks like there was a misunderstanding. Under the watchful eyes of the two, Derek put down his pistol and said, I saw you shoot this little girl so, I thought that you were some kind of perverted serial killer, though you do look quite like one. There was no longer a threat of the gun as Big Daddy finally breathed a sigh of relief. But when he heard Derek's last sentence, his eyelids couldn't help twitching a few times. Why did he start to give me emotional damage? Derek asked curiously. So what are you two doing? We were training. Before Big Daddy could open his mouth, Mindy replied in a childish voice while looking at Derek with glowing eyes. How did you do that just now, intercepting bullets with bullets? Oh my god, this is so cool. You aren't a superhero like those guys in the comics, are you? Derek cheerfully replied. Do you want to learn? I'll teach you. Yes. Ahem. Big Daddy coughed and interrupted their conversation. He grabbed Mindy's little hand and said to Derek, Sorry, we still have things to do. My daughter and I won't bother you. Big Daddy then led Mindy away from the scene quickly. Derek didn't stop them because he had already guessed the identities of these two people. Hit Girl and Big Daddy from Kick-Ass. Big Daddy was an anti-hero like Punisher. He was also a ruthless person who never left a criminal alive. Don't be fooled by Mindy's cuteness either. She might be an innocent child now, but she grows up to be a bloody and violent person too and all of its credit goes to her father's skillful upbringing. Her training was comparable to the iron-blooded training of Sparta. After the two left, Derek put away his pistol, hummed a little song and walked home leisurely. In the next few days, Derek made some new things. Although the two pistols had been very smooth in use, Derek still felt that they were far from being the best. After all, originally, Derek planned to try to modify a sniper rifle or even a bazooka. But, when he found their prices, he understood that they were not something he, a poor man, could afford. Ever since then, Derek changed his way of thinking. Since he couldn't afford to play around with firearms, he decided not to modify them. You know, the way to improve one's strength was not just to modify firearms. Other lethal weapons such as grenades or flashbangs can enhance one's combat effectiveness too. Derek might not have enough money for high-level firearms and weapons, but he could still afford ammunition and some grenades. Then Derek tried to modify his ammunition instead of his guns. And it turned out to be a great success. Derek was very excited when he discovered this. He thought about Hawkeye from Avengers. He was proficient in archery and had no superpower, so how could he become an Avenger? Well, nepotism by Nick Fury could not be ruled out. But anyhow, it was undeniable that Hawkeye's arrows with different effects combined with his archery were very useful. Thinking of this, Derek was suddenly inspired and started to modify the ammunition. His first idea was to increase the power of a grenade. As far as Derek knew, there were only a few people who could withstand the damage done by a grenade, and those kinds of people were very strong. Therefore, in order to fight them, Derek's modification of grenades had only one goal. If he couldn't kill the opponent with a grenade, he has to reduce their combat power and ability. For example, he could put a lot of chili into the smoke bomb and change the white flash of the flashbang into several colorful lights. Although most of those things may hurt him during combat, Derek had the self-healing ability. It was easy to know who could have the last laugh. 
Looking at the gunpowder spread all over his room, Derek shook his head. It feels like this is not enough, and my money is almost finished. It seems that I have to find Weasel for another commission. Chapter 33 Derek went to the empty field again to test the power of his newly modified ammunition, and the results made him very satisfied. He walked by the abandoned construction site again, but did not see the father and daughter duo. Anyways, Derek knew that the reason was not him, after all. He looked so kind. By the way, why do I always meet anti-heroes? Be it Wade, Frank, Mindy or Big Daddy, none of them was a kind-hearted and friendly person. Derek had a feeling that he, a cute and innocent sheep, had fallen into a pack of wolves. If this continued, it would be difficult to ensure that his sane mind would not be affected by these wolves. Back in Brooklyn, Derek happened to see a restaurant and walked in, since he hadn't had proper dinner till today. During his period of stay in America, Derek was busy with various things. So he mostly ate fast food. To be honest, fast food in America was really cheap according to him. Not only was the portion large, but also the price was also cheap. This was also the reason why many poor people were keen to eat fast food, which led to the emergence of so many obese people. Although Derek was not afraid of gaining weight by consuming fast food, he was afraid that he would throw up soon, if he continued eating only that. Moreover, now that he has time, he plans to change his taste. Walking into the restaurant, Derek found that the restaurant was almost full. A waiter came over to Derek, and asked him with a smile, a table for how many people sir? One person. Was sorry, sir, we don't have a vacant table for one person at the moment. The waiter apologized professionally, however, if you don't mind, you can share a table with another customer. Yeah sure. Derek didn't care, it didn't matter to him where he ate, all that mattered was food. Food is love. The waiter walked away and came back quickly. There are two guests who have agreed to share the table sir, please follow me. Derek nodded and followed the waiter into the restaurant and stopped near a corner. Derek looked at the seat and found that there were two young men, one was a fat man with slightly curly hair, and beside him was a blind man with a guide stick. Seeing them, Derek suddenly felt a little uncomfortable, but he didn't care, thinking he was just affected by the environment of the restaurant. Derek then sat beside them. He took the menu from the waiter and ordered two main dishes that sounded good. At this time, the curly-haired fat man said enthusiastically, It seems that we are not lonely tonight. Derek laughed and said, There are two of you. You were not lonely before anyways. The curly-haired fat man smiled and did not respond. He took out a business card and handed it to Derek. My name is Fudge Nelson, and this is my colleague Matt Murdoch. We are the lawyers and founders of the Nelson Murdoch Law Firm. We have been in the industry for a short time and are actively looking for new clients. If you need the help or guidance of a lawyer, we would be happy to help you. Fudge introduced both of them with a smile, looked at his silent companion beside him, and asked in a puzzled tone, Hey, Matt, why aren't you talking all of a sudden? Derek took the business card and looked at it, and couldn't help looking up at Matt. Is this a coincidence? I was worried that I would be influenced by some great people, and here appears another. Although Matt was blind, he was actually a hero too. In the future, they will join defenders. Although he cannot see, he has super sensory abilities and superb fighting skills. He is the famous blind hero, Daredevil. No wonder Derek felt a little strange when he just sat down. Judging from Matt's reaction, Derek guessed that his keen sense of smell recognized the residual gunpowder smoke on Derek's body, which aroused his vigilance, and Matt was now observing Derek. Derek felt a sudden chill run down his spine. Wait, isn't he observing me without my consent? That's an invasion of my privacy. Let's just bullet time. Matt Murdoch, codename Daredevil. This evening, Matt and Fudge came to this restaurant on Fudge's recommendation to celebrate the establishment of their new law firm. As a result, when they were halfway through eating, the waiter suddenly came over and asked if they could share the table with a customer. As a superhero, Matt was naturally kind-hearted, and was happy to help strangers with this little favor. However, when the customer approached them, Matt smelled gunpowder remaining on their body, as if they had experienced a gun battle not long ago. Fortunately, there was no smell of blood, so Matt's vigilance dropped a little. Matt knew that this customer's identity was not simple. With a skeptical attitude, he began to observe the stranger in front of him. Definitely, he did not use his eyes to observe, 
but relied on his super sensory ability to collect information. Through super hearing, Matt can hear the heartbeat of the other party getting very fast. As Matt continued to listen, he felt that something was wrong. His heartbeat seems to be faster, it's getting faster and faster. After a while, Matt's eyes widened. Derek's heart rate exceeded 300 beats per minute. This was certainly a major heart problem. Just when Matt was frightened, he heard the heart rate suddenly slow down. Matt froze up. What's going on? Matt was not an expert in medical matters, so he couldn't figure out what was going on with his heart rate, but he knew that something was weird. Suddenly, the heart rate increased again and reached 400 beats per minute within moments. Matt almost stood up. In less than a second, the heart rate suddenly dropped again. Matt's face turned pale as Derek's heartbeat made his heartbeat dance along with it. Before Matt's heart eased up, the weird heartbeat rate increased again. For the next half minute, Matt listened to the heart rate rise and fall until it settled into a rough rhythm. Matt clutched his heart. He felt as if he was sitting in an exciting music fest. His expression was dull and he murmured in disbelief, is this symphony of destiny? Chapter 34 At the same time as Matt, Derek also clutched his chest with a pale face. This is the first time he had turned on and off the bullet time so quickly, which made him feel a little weird in his heart. He was immortal but not emotionless. The quick shifts in his heartbeat made him nervous for a moment. Though, if it was someone else playing with their hearts like this well, it would rather be their souls singing the symphony of fate while traveling somewhere else. Derek, who was not weak to succumb to things like nervousness and anxiety in this life, gritted his teeth, smiled complacently and looked at Matt's distorted face. Moi, don't ever invade my privacy again. I'll file a case against you. Fudge was in a daze this whole while. He felt like instead of Derek, he was the outsider interrupting Matt and Derek from having dinner. Seeing Derek and Matt staring intensely at each other while clutching their chests at the same time, Fudge felt that he could not participate in their secret conversation at all. But the question was, wasn't Matt blind? Where's the eye contact? Why did he feel that they were staring at each other? When the Symphony of Destiny was halfway through, Matt finally couldn't help but restrain his sensory abilities and give up on observing Derek. Matt forced out a smile and said, Hi, I'm Matt Murdock. The uncomfortable feeling of being observed disappeared as Derek also exited the bullet time, and said with a complacent smile, Hello, Lawyer Murdoch, I am Derek. Seeing the two of them first clutching their hearts and then introducing themselves with pale faces, if Fudge hadn't witnessed the whole process, he would have thought they were two heart patients communicating about their condition. Feeling that the weird atmosphere gradually became harmonious, Fudge said, our law firm is on 46th Street in West Midtown. If you ever need any legal advice, you can visit us. West Midtown, also known as Hell's Kitchen. Due to the reputation of Hell's Kitchen, which is famous for its messy and backward living facilities, serious ethnic conflicts and super high crime rate, local residents usually use the more normal sounding name. West Midtown, especially Fudge who runs a law firm there. He was afraid that the reputation of Hell's Kitchen would scare away their Mundot clients. Derek took a sip of water. Speaking of legal advice, I do have a question that has puzzled me for several years. Hearing Derek's words, Fudge suddenly became interested. Before he could say anything, Matt asked, what's the question? Since he could not use his sensory ability to judge Derek's real identity, he could question him like this. Derek then proceeded to ask with a serious look, it's like this. If there is a very popular hamburger restaurant, and there is a fast food restaurant opposite this hamburger restaurant, but because the business of this hamburger restaurant is too good, the fast food restaurant has no business. So the fast food restaurant owner has been trying to make a fortune by stealing hamburger recipes. However, the plan of the fast food restaurant owner did not succeed, because every time he stole the secret recipe for the hamburger, he would be driven out by the owner of the hamburger restaurant and the chef in various ways, which caused the fast food restaurant owner to suffer mental and physical damage. Are the hamburger restaurant owner and chef breaking the law or the fast food restaurant owner? Fudge was taken aback for a moment. Why did this story sound familiar to him? Matt didn't think too much, but looked at the case from a lawyer's point of view and replied, It's not breaking the law. The behavior of the two people in the burger restaurant was justified and it was a measure taken to protect their legal rights. The behavior of the owner of the fast food restaurant was rather that of a burglar, 
and if relevant clues can be provided, the owner of the hamburger restaurant can sue the owner of the fast food restaurant for a fat sum. Derek nodded. I see, then I would like to thank you on the behalf of hamburger shop's owner. I have a question. It's been a long time so I don't remember exactly but, is the owner of this restaurant called the Crab Boss? Fudge wore a weird expression on his face, but Matt didn't notice it. Matt asked in a puzzled tone, Fudge, do you know this restaurant? Ah, how should I put it? Matt, you don't often watch TV. That burger restaurant is quite famous all over the world. It's so famous. Why didn't I know about this restaurant till today? Recalling all the hamburger restaurants he knew, Matt still couldn't find one that matched the criterion of being world famous. Seeing that Matt still didn't understand, Fudge said helplessly, You may not know this restaurant, but there is an employee in it whose name you should have heard of. What is his name? Matt got excited that he knew someone famous. Spongebob. Matt. Derek clapped his hands and praised the two. As expected of lawyer Murdoch, he immediately answered this question that had puzzled me since I was a child. What kind of nonsense did you think about when you were a kid? Fudge thought while maintaining a kind smile on his face. To thank you two for the help, let me treat you to this meal. Without giving the two of them time to refuse, Derek beckoned the waiter over, charged their bills to my account. Yes, sir. Woohoo, Derek, I offer you a toast. Fudge immediately picked up the drink in his hand to express his gratitude. He didn't care what questions Derek had asked, he just liked generous and ridiculously rich people. After hearing this, Matt also had to raise his drink. Thank you for this treat. Derek raised his water glass. Haha, <laughs> it's nothing compared to how much you helped me. I may still have some legal issues to consult in the future. At that time, I will visit lawyer Nelson and lawyer Murdoch. Hearing Derek's words, Fudge's attitude became more enthusiastic. He left Matt out and chatted with Derek. Their talks ranged from SpongeBob SquarePants, which seemed most interesting to Derek, to the safety impact of the Pacific Volcanic Earthquake Zone on America's surrounding environment. Derek also answered everything, whether he knew about it or not. Listening to the two's nonsense chatting, Matt couldn't speak at all. Ha, huh, I feel like an outsider, interrupting their dinner being intelligent is really tough. Chapter 35 Seeing that the time was already 10 o'clock, Derek said goodbye to Matt and Fudge, and left the restaurant. He then walked to the mercenary bar, walking into the dark alley. At a distance, Derek suddenly saw two figures coming out from the door of the bar, and then leaving to the other end of the alley. Why does that back look so familiar? Derek looked at the two leaving figures but did not think much about them and walked towards the bar. When Derek walked into the bar, he found that there seemed to be something wrong with the atmosphere in there. It was different from the harmonious and peaceful atmosphere of drinking and fighting. At the moment, the bar was very quiet, only some whispering voices which were discussing something could be heard. Derek noticed that some mercenaries were holding pistols in their hands, which was not in line with the behavior rules of the bar. Derek wasn't in the mood to observe and investigate, so he went straight to Weasel at the bar. What happened here? You came just in time we are fucked. Seeing Derek's face, Weasel said with a serious expression, to be precise, you and Wade are in serious trouble. The Francis guy you mentioned earlier brought a female version of the Terminator to the door just now, wanting to know about Wade's whereabouts. It looks like they already know that Wade is still alive. It turned out to be them. Derek narrowed his eyes. No wonder the backs looked so familiar. It turned out to be Francis, and the other one should be the female mutant named Angela. Weasel said, thanks to my old buddies, they didn't do anything major here, but they took away the photo of Wade and Vanessa. Behind the bar were the photos of all the dead mercenaries. They were put up in memory of them. Wade, who was suffering from cancer, also left some photos to be put up before becoming a guinea pig. Their target is Vanessa, Derek said without hesitation. It was not hard to think that Francis would use Wade's most important person to lure him out. Weasel nodded in agreement. I thought so too, so I notified Wade, and now he has gone to find Vanessa. I hope everything is fine. Derek didn't speak, he was trying to recall the events of the movie once again. Weasel, have you heard of the X-Men? X-Men. Weasel didn't understand why Derek asked this suddenly, but he still thought about it, and answered Derek seriously. I seem to have heard this name before. It is said that they were a mutant organization dedicated to peace, 
and their main activities were from the 1960s to the 1990s. It has long since disappeared, and I think that it's just a myth made up by the mutants. Why are you asking this all of a sudden? Do you expect the X-Men to help you too? Weasel asked. Yeah, Derek's face was full of worry. He had already discovered that although there were mutants in this world, there was no news about X-Men. It was as if this organization did not exist in the world. If that were the case, then the question arises, without the existence of X-Men, the two important supporting characters in the movie, Colossus and Warhead would not appear. Can Wade find a suitable helper to deal with Francis then? After a while, Weasel received a call. Seeing the caller ID, Weasel showed Derek that it was Wade calling. When the phone was answered, Weasel heard Wade snarl. Fuck. Fuck. That bastard took Vanessa. Prepare a gun for me. I'm going to stick the muzzle inside his ass and shoot his shit out of him. Weasel secretly thought that Wade was slowly getting worse and hurriedly advised him. Wade, calm down. Let's find a place to meet. I'm calm. I'm fucking calm now, right now. Fuck who put this can here. Come here, you motherfucka. I fuck your dash. Wade's voice was full of anger and mania as he yelled on the phone, meet me at your house. With the crisp ringing of the bar, the signal from Wade's end was disconnected. Weasel's face changed slightly as he said, damn it. Wade doesn't have the key to my house. That guy is going to break my door, right? Relax. You know Wade, it would be the best if he only breaks your door. Derek tried his best to comfort Weasel. Weasel colon quote dot 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 dot. Let's go. If we don't go, it might get too late. Weasel hurriedly found someone to look after the bar and rushed out of the gate with Derek. Derek seemed to have thought of something suddenly, so he turned around and ran in the other direction. I'll go home to pick up some important things. Send me your address and I'll be there soon. Calm down, Wade, you must be calm right now. In a room, Weasel persuaded Wade earnestly, whilst looking at the door behind him broken into several pieces. Get me a gun. I want it right now. Wade smashed the wall with a punch. His hand healed within moments, but so could not be said for the wall. All right, I see. Weasel didn't pour oil on Wade's raging head and started collecting guns from various spots in his house. While Weasel was collecting weapons, Derek walked in through the shattered door. He was carrying a huge traveling bag on his back. Yo, Wade, long time no see. Derek looked at Wade and greeted him. Anxiety was visible on Wade's face as he said quickly, Mate, this is not the time for a fucking party. Francis, that damn dish soap took Vanessa. It's about time for me to pay him back. I know that and that is why, I'm here to help. Wade looked at Derek's travel bag and said again, Hey, I think you may have made a mistake. This is not a field trip or is your plan to invite Francis over to have a picnic with you and then poison him secretly. Definitely not. These are my tools. Derek then proceeded to open the travel bag, pouring out a large number of guns and ammunition. After his bag was emptied, Derek said regretfully, No need to say it. I know this much gear might not be enough, but the money I had saved for so long was only about 200,000 United States dollars. I can only buy this much. Wade stood there, looking at how his innocent mate had changed within the short course of time. Wade did not meet him, Derek definitely got into bad company. Meanwhile, Weasel stood in one place with several guns in his hands, looking speechlessly at Derek's pile of guns. Chapter 36 Are you going to wage a war against the country or something? As a mercenary, it's only logical for me to have these many weapons, it might be a teeny bit extra though. Are you sure it's just a teeny bit more? Weasel's nerves got the best of him as he stared at the pile of guns in front of him. He knew that Derek had a large amount of ammunition with him, but he never expected him to bring them all at once. That too, in a travel bag. Derek then said, you have to remember, our opponent this time is a mutant. We cannot be negligent. These are good babies that have been modified by me. They will be helpful in dealing with Francis and his lackeys. Hearing his words, Weasel picked up a pistol from Derek's pile and examined it carefully. Isn't this just an ordinary M9 pistol? What's so special about it? Derek grinned and said proudly. The most unique thing about this pistol is that it has a fingerprint shooting function. Only if it detects my fingerprint will it shoot. If the fingerprint on it is of some person other than me. What happens if the fingerprint is wrong? Weasel asked curiously. Boom. Whoa, the fuck? Why didn't you say that earlier? 
Seeing the weasel's face, Derek explained. I haven't had time to activate that function of this pistol, yet, so it won't explode yet. Weasel immediately breathed a sigh of relief, and hurriedly returned the pistol to Derek, not daring to touch his pile of weapons. Who knows what kind of weird weapons might be there. Wade looked at the pile of guns and ammunition, obviously misunderstanding something, and thanked Derek. You are still a good friend, you are indeed a real bed mate who has slept together with me for more than two months. I will accept these friendly donations of yours. When I blow that dish soap's head off, you will be the first I'll remember, Vanessa later. You think too much, these are all my property. I am giving them to you for free. After some fiddling, Derek successfully activated the gun in his hand and said, I mean, I will go with you to greet Francis. Wade was stunned and looked at Derek. I know you have done a lot of things recently, but what we have to face is a group of armed soldiers and a female Terminator who can withstand bullets. These people are not normal people with guns. Derek didn't answer Wade. After all, seeing is believing. Boom. Derek swung his arm with a jerk as a bullet escaped from the gun in his hand, aimed at Weasel. Before the Weasel could react, the bullet asked around him and hit the flying darts target on the wall behind him. Holy motherfucker. Weasel saw Derek shoot at him suddenly. He was so frightened that he subconsciously closed his eyes, but he did not feel the pain he had expected. Weasel opened his eyes and found himself standing still. He panicked. I, I'm not dead. I obviously heard some gunshots. Wade looked at the hole in the target behind him and said with an exaggerated expression, I think I'm hallucinating. Is there a hole in the target behind me? Did the bullet turn? I guarantee that Newton will definitely jump out of the coffin when he sees this shit. Hey Derek, which law did you use? How did you do it? Derek explained, the law is very simple. That is, the moment the bullet is ejected from the chamber, the shooter shakes his wrist quickly to give the bullet a horizontal acceleration, thus forming an arc. This is my unique gunfighting technique. To demonstrate his skill, Derek swung his arm again and shot an arc-shaped bullet at Weasel again. Weasel, oh, dot 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 dot. There is a person who can heal right there. Why do you have to use me, an ordinary person, as a target? Brilliant. You are hired. Wade happened to be in urgent need of helpers. Seeing that Derek was so awesome, he didn't care where he learnt these skills from and agreed to his joining. Just then, Wade's cell phone vibrated. That dish soap just sent me a message. Wade read the content on the phone and said angrily, Vanessa is in his hands. And he wants me to go to the recycling station at 6 o'clock tomorrow morning. This piece of shit, doesn't he know that's not a time to get a taxi quote? Weasel said, it seems that he has made preparations in advance, waiting for you to fall into some trap. Without any further ado, Derek grabbed the guns on the ground and began to arm himself, confidently saying, with the three of us and our power of friendship, there is nothing to worry about. Three people, Weasel asked suspiciously, do you two still have some other helper coming? You don't think of yourself as a human. Derek had a surprised expression as if he had heard about the discovery of Atlanta. Weasel's face darkened as he said, I am a strategist, not a combatant. Ten minutes later, Derek reappeared wearing a full body armor, standing in front of the weasel. He wore tactical equipment with a large caliber revolver in the left and right holsters, a 12 caliber shotgun on his back, two rows of various ammunition crossed on his chest, and many more things. Seeing this attire, Weasel complained, isn't this amount of equipment too much? You can never have too much firepower. Weasel, you're still innocent so you might not know yet. As he said that, Derek, who seemed not very satisfied, grabbed two grenades and stuffed them into his trouser pockets. The corner of the weasel's mouth twitched as he watched him. Compared to Derek, Wade looked much cooler. He wore a black and red tight uniform, a red mask with panda eyes on his face, and two katanas pinned on his back. Among other things, he looked quite relaxed, unlike Derek. Derek seemed uncomfortable walking with that armor of his. Wade looked at Derek's outfit, then looked at his own and exclaimed, We will definitely be the best duo out there. We should give ourselves a name. What do you think of the Deadpool Alliance? Nope, not good. Derek then offered his suggestion, anyways. Since we both have similar abilities, we can call ourselves something like the Immortal Duo. Chapter 37 the location of the recycling station Francis invited the immortal duo to was a little far away, and they would need to take a car there. For the duo wearing full armor, ordinary taxis were definitely not a good choice. 
If they take it, the driver might drop them at the gate of the police department. Fortunately, Wade had some connections and quickly called a taxi from an acquaintance. The driver was an Indian man. When he saw Derek and Wade carrying a large bag of weapons, he just asked them what they were doing out of curiosity. He didn't show the panic that normal people would have. Derek felt that he was the only normal person among these, and the pressure on him was enormous. The driver and Wade were chatting happily. As the Indian man said, Mr. Deadpool, you were right before, one needs to control their own destiny. Nobody can order me. Derek looked at the map and said, turn left ahead and stop. Okay, sir. The taxi stopped at the corner as Derek and Wade stepped out of the car. From a distance, Derek saw the huge amounts of abandoned waste and a huge ship at the recycling station. You forgot to take your bag. Derek glanced at the taxi and reminded Wade. Oh yeah, damn. Wade quickly got his weapon bag from the taxi. He almost went into the fight with only two katanas. This guy is really unreliable. F parenthesis dot author's note. Took you a long to figure that out. Derek curled his lips, took out his binoculars, and looked at the recycling station. It was full of various piles of waste. But he couldn't see any person, nor did he see Vanessa, the hostage. As for the deck of the abandoned ship, it was too high for him, and it was difficult to see the situation there clearly. Wade, what is a plan? Derek asked. Wade grabbed two submachine guns and said, Go straight in, kill all the villains like a superhero, and then save the heroine, my girlfriend Vanessa. In the eyes of the supporting role, you, the hero, me and the heroine kiss passionately. Derek shyly said, do I need to wait until you two start removing clothes or? Wade looked at Derek with amazement and surprise. Anyhow, back to the situation right now. Because things happened so suddenly, the two didn't have any time to think about plans. Derek thought for a while and said, we can't just rush in like this. Hey, you've come here now. Are you going to back down? I mean you can't rush forward blindly. Your girlfriend is still in their hands. If they threaten us with your girlfriend, we will be suppressed. What ungar bunga are you talking about? Derek then proceeded to explain it all to the dumb Wade. For example, they can ask us to throw off all the arms on us, otherwise they will cut off your girlfriend's limbs. Threatening to chop off her head or dash. Fuck, stop talking. At this moment Derek's words made Wade feel that Derek was more like an evil villain, and said in a panic, Jude, I don't think they think as cruelly as you do. But you're right, we can't just rush in. We have to find Vanessa first. So, my plan is to sneak in secretly, rescue Vanessa first without anyone noticing, kill Francis on the way back out, and then go back to our houses. That's a fucking brilliant idea. F parenthesis dot author's note. You two fr dash underscore dash. After the two reached an agreement, they found a secret corner and sneaked into the recycling station. Ignoring the area that would be the best ambush point, the two sneaked into the ship from the back. When Derek and Wade reached the main body of the ship, as they had expected, several armed soldiers appeared, guarding the stairway leading to the deck. If it was him a few minutes ago, Wade would have taken both his guns and charged straight up. But now, he felt that he should be more stable. Wade said in a low voice, there are five people in total. I'll get rid of the three on the left. I leave the remaining two on the right to you. Don't bother with it. They don't know this young master's heaven-defying technique of shooting. Derek took out a small pistol from his armor. He entered bullet time, locked on the positions of the five armed soldiers, and pulled the trigger five times. Accompanied by a gunshot that couldn't be louder, five armed soldiers fell to the ground. Wade went closer to check their pulse and found that the five people had a tiny anesthetic needle inserted in their necks. But he didn't know why they were all foaming at the mouth, and their bodies were twitching non-stop. What's this? Wade couldn't help asking. That is anesthetic mixed with toxins that ensure that they will die peacefully without any pain during the process. So I named this gun the Gun of Kindness, Derek explained his idea. The Gun of Kindness. Wade watched the armed soldiers' eyes widen. It was obvious that they were not unconscious. They were just unable to move. They could only feel the toxin getting injected into their bodies, as it spread throughout their body. And finally, they die without a single complaint. As you can see, there was no pain at all. If the patient is so quiet, that is the only answer. Without the obstruction of any more armed soldiers, 
The two arrived on the deck soon, and saw a large group of armed soldiers gathered not far away. Among them were the faces of Francis and Angela, and behind them was Vanessa, trapped in an oxygen chamber similar to the one used on Wade. Oh, they are here. The process was so smooth that Wade couldn't help but get excited, although the scene is not very exciting. I think I have fallen in love with your style. What should we do next? Do we have a perfect and clean assassination or a super perfect and clean assassination question mark open quote? Unexpectedly, Derek stood up suddenly, quickly took out a few grenades and threw them over, yelling, assassinate my ass. At such a good opportunity, I'll definitely try out the explosives. Chapter 38 Seeing the group of armed soldiers standing closely together, Derek couldn't resist the urge to test his grenades. The soldiers looked like bowling pins to Derek. Boom exclamation point exclamation point boom exclamation point exclamation point boom. A few grenades fell accurately under the feet of the soldiers as the sound of explosions rang out. Francis and Angela were still waiting for Wade to arrive, but they were knocked to the ground by the sudden explosion. Since their positions were relatively closer to Vanessa and the grenade thrown by Derek deliberately avoided her position, they were not injured by the explosion too much. When Francis and Angela regained their senses, they saw that many soldiers were dead, and there was a lot of damage on the floor. The soldiers who were still alive and badly hurt, were crying out in pain. A few of the soldiers who were outside didn't get hurt in the big explosion. It's you Francis was shocked to see Derek. According to his knowledge, Derek should have died in the fire long ago, and his body should have been buried under the research institute. Francis quickly thought of something. It seems that you, like that joker, have received the mutant gene in your body. I'm curious, what is your ability dash? Bang. Derek didn't fuck around anymore. He had a pistol in his hand, and so, he pulled the trigger. Wade also raised two submachine guns to shoot at the positions of Francis and Angela while shouting, Eat shit, you motherfucker. Watch our undead duo blow your ass up. The moment they raised their guns, Angela stood up and covered Francis with her body. The bullets hit her body without causing any real damage to it. However, a bullet seemed to avoid her and proceeded towards Francis in the rear. Francis's back suddenly felt cold, and with his superb reaction ability, he raised the tactical axe in his hand just in time to block the bullet. An arse bullet. Francis was startled, thinking that this was done by Derek using his mutant ability. Having personally experienced the danger of this kind of marksmanship, he immediately ordered, Angela, don't worry about that red joker, get rid of that Jackie Chan. Remember, don't give him a chance to shoot. Yes. Angela locked her eyes on Derek as she suddenly charged at him, like a tank charging straight at Derek. Little guy, this female Tyrannosaurus will be handed over to you. Wade took two steps back and decisively gave way. Facing the rushing Angela, Derek's heart rate soared through the heavens. With the secretion of adrenaline in the body, Derek's body functions also began to improve. The super heavy equipment on his body was no longer a burden. The moment right before Angela bumped into him, he dodged sideways. His speed was at least two times faster than before. Derek put the pistol back into his sleeve and replaced it with the two revolvers in his left and right holsters. Bang bang. Huge amounts of recoil came, and two large calibers hit Angela's head. But she just shook her head lightly in response to it. This level of damage was still nothing for her. Angela turned around at a leisurely pace. She remembered that the person in front of her was easily maimed by a single punch in the research institute. Although she didn't know why his injuries recovered so quickly, for her, this kind of gunplay posed no threat at all. Unless it was bombed by heavy weapons. It was very difficult to injure her steel body. Gina looked at Derek playfully and said with a sneer, Hey, small guy, is this all that you're capable of? If it's just this, then you can die. Let me see if you can survive my punch this time. Derek narrowed his eyes, raised the revolver, and pulled the trigger again. Facing the black muzzle of the gun, Gina didn't bother to care about it and walked towards Derek with a smile. She had no intention of even trying to dodge. This time again, the bullet hit her head. Angela only protected her eyes and let the bullets shoot over. But she didn't know those bullets were modified by Derek. The moment two bullets touched her, they exploded and turned into two balls of flames, enveloping her entire head. On the other side, Francis and Wade had started a duel combined with the remaining soldiers attacking Wade, trying to suppress him with their heavy firepower. 
Wade smiled strangely and raised his submachine gun to shoot Francis. But suddenly the barrel of the gun clicked several times. Wade looked at the submachine gun suspiciously and figured that it was out of bullets. Oh my god, it's embarrassing. Seeing the non-serious Wade, Francis found the right moment to strike him with his axe. Wade let out a strange cry and was instantly smashed into a sieve by the surging bullets. Looking at the fast self-healing wounds on Wade, Francis raised the corner of his mouth and said, I may have underestimated your ability before. It has huge amounts of value and potential as a research subject. There was greed in Francis's eyes. If he had known that Wade's self-healing ability was so good, he would not have left Wade in that research institute back then. He now wanted to study his body more than sell it for a good price. Wade pulled out the two katanas on his back and said fiercely, Trust me, I will cut your head open later, and study whether it is filled with brains or shit. Just when they were about to fight again, they heard a piercing scream. Chapter 39 Ah, the scream came from Angela who was showing off her power and durability moments ago. Now, she was frantically slapping her head engulfed in fire and screaming. Francis was shocked and quickly looked at Angela's condition. How could he hurt Angela? Francis found it difficult to imagine what kind of agony Angela must have been experiencing to let out such a high-pitched, girlish scream, especially given her durability, which was comparable to that of a bull. Angela continued screaming and finally extinguished the fire on her head. The flames obviously couldn't break through her steel skin, but her face now resembled a black man. She was perfect. A black face, a large back and big hands. I just need a farm and a why shit no. Sorry. Derek said to himself and continued looking at Angela's hilarious appearance. Angela's hair had not been strengthened by her ability. The flame couldn't damage her face, but so wasn't the case for her hair. After the continuous baptism by the flames, the hair on her head was completely fuzzy, exuding a smell similar to burnt feathers. Her hairline had moved back approximately 10 centimeters. In the eyes of others, Angela's hair was just like a half-worn wig revealing a shiny burnt forehead. Angela touched her forehead in disbelief. She couldn't accept that she was bald now. Ha <laughs> ha. Damn queen. You slain seeing Angela's new hairstyle. Derek couldn't hold back and yelled out loud. Under Angela's cannibalistic gaze, he waved his hand embarrassedly. Believe me, this was purely an accident. I think this hairstyle is acceptable. This is America after all. Well, can you cover your head now? I'm afraid I'll laugh. I am going to kill you. As Angela's eyes turned red, the ground beneath her feet began to tremble. In the blink of an eye, she covered several meters in a single bound. Her towering frame now looming over Derek. Derek immediately retreated to create a distance and turned his head up to narrowly avoid a right uppercut. Angela's fist hit the rear container hard, and the steel shell was dented instantly. Damn, I might have just died. Taking advantage of Angela's short pause, Derek raised the revolver in his hand, leaned towards Angela's head and shot again. Bang. The bullet turned into flames, setting Angela's head on fire once again. Without even sparing a moment to tend to Derek, who stood before her, she let out a blood-curdling scream and frantically patted out the flames that had engulfed her head. When the flames finally subsided, she was left with nothing but charred remnants of what used to be her hair. Angela's face now was very gloomy. Her eyes were fixed on Derek, full of murderous intent. A cold voice came out of her mouth. When I catch you, I will pull out your hair strand by strand. Derek asked in surprise. No, no, I'm fine. I don't want a matching hairstyle with you. Hearing his words, Angela gritted her teeth. Damn you, Asian guy. Angela let out a low growl, and her speed increased once again, her body violently clinging to Derek. When dealing with enemies armed with guns, she chose to reduce the distance. She was tall and cumbersome, but her body movements were extremely agile. However, as if Derek had predicted all her moves in advance, he moved his feet and dodged her fist in various strange postures. The muzzle of his revolver also frequently flashed, and several flames ignited Angela's head again and again. Facts have proved that once a woman is in rage, she is crazier than a man. In this state, Angela didn't care about her appearance anymore. She let her hair be ignited by the bullets, and frantically waved her fists at Derek. Ghost Rider, that you, my boy. 
Derek was startled. He didn't expect Angela to be so hot-headed and fierce. F parenthesis dot author's note. She's literally hot-headed right now though. Seeing that he couldn't maintain the distance, Derek immediately took out a grenade from his pockets. Noticing Derek's movements, Angela snorted coldly and said disdainfully, You think the grenade will affect me? And, don't forget that you are also in its explosion range. I would love to see you detonate it. I mean, you asked me to. Derek pulled out the safety pin without any hesitation, and closed his eyes as if he was in his final moments before dying. Angela was not afraid either. She jumped at Derek with her eyes wide open and a smile covering her face. The next moment, a dazzling light came from the grenade. Boom. Ah. Angela quickly shielded her eyes, collapsing to the ground in agony, as tears streamed down her face. The explosion had temporarily deafened her, and her ears were ringing from the deafening blast. That's not a fucking grenade, it's a freaking flashbomb. Even with Angela's steel body, her eyes and ears are still vulnerable parts. As a result, she opened her eyes stupidly and stared directly at the flashbomb which was unbearable for anyone. She could see nothing in the vast expanse of whiteness. At such a close distance, Derek was also affected by the flashbang. His thin eyelids could not block the bright light at all. I am going to kill you, Angela yelled at the top of her lungs. Ah, what are you talking about? I can't hear you, Derek replied. Go to hell. Chapter 40 With Derek's self-healing ability, his body quickly healed the injuries caused by the modified explosive. As his sight gradually recovered, Derek saw Angela standing not far away with an empty head, slapping it vigorously like a madman, and constantly uttering various curses. At the same time, a large number of armed soldiers rushed onto the deck from the stairs. They came to the deck quickly after hearing the explosion. When they saw Angela's state and slapping herself, they couldn't help but freeze in their spots. Immediately afterwards, they saw Derek armed to the teeth and Wade waving katana in the distance. Seeing them, the soldiers knew that these two were the enemies they were going to ambush. The armed soldiers didn't have much time to think about it, and immediately drew their guns and shot at Derek, who was the closest to them. As the bullets hit him, Derek used a sliding shovel to hide behind the container beside him. Noticing him disappearing, the soldiers made two small teams which went towards the container from the two sides, while a large team stood back to kill Derek, in case he tried to run away. At this moment, the crisp sound of clanging could be heard from the rear of the container. There was a lot of smoke coming from the container, the smoke gradually spread and finally covered the whole area. After a few moments, there were sounds of footsteps around them. Damn it. He's up there one of the soldiers found Derek above the container. But, it was too late. Derek, who was standing on the container, jumped high in the air and landed in the middle of the soldiers. The explosives in his hands had been replaced with a modified M93R gun. Bullet time. Derek felt his blood pressure rise suddenly, his heart beating violently, and the movements of all armed soldiers became slow. Derek pulled the trigger of the gun in his hand. Bang bang bang. Derek's figure constantly swung around in the air, his arms moving rapidly to control the trajectory of the bullet. It seemed like indiscriminate shooting, but each bullet was accurately shot towards the enemy. In less than a few seconds, Derek's magazines were emptied. The magazine was emptied, but the gunfire did not stop. A new magazine was loaded into the pistol through the propeller device in his clothes. Every time the spark flashed from the muzzle, there would be one less standing figure in the smoke. God, what kind of monster is he? The armed soldiers were terrified. This fight was not fair for them at all. Derek didn't care about what they thought, and before the smoke dissipated, made sure no man stood alive anymore. Boom. The last soldier had his head explode and fell backwards. Derek grabbed two pistols and stood quietly atop the pile of corpses. This was what Angela saw when she regained some vision and stopped waving her hands randomly in the air. At this time, she realized that she had been punching her own soldiers, and not Derek this whole while. Fuck. Angela growled with red and swollen eyes. She grabbed a giant tire beside her, and threw it at Derek, as if it were a discus. Although Derek heard the roar of the violent woman, he had no time to dodge the huge tire bigger than himself, so he hurriedly raised his right arm to block the front. He felt a terrifying force hit his right arm. He was hit by the huge tire and flew into the iron wall more than 10 meters away. Derek spat out a mouthful of blood, his right arm severely twisted and shapeshifting uniquely. 
I think I might have broken a bone. Angela walked in front of him with her red swollen eyes. Seeing Derek's miserable state, she showed a cheerful smile. You bug, I finally caught you. Do you have any last words? Yes. I want to see some long hair on your head and also, I want to drink this coke. Derek took out the can of coke from his trousers pocket, while his arm trembled due to the minor injury. He opened the can with one hand. Go to hell and drink with the devil. Angela smiled cruelly and raised her fist to smash his head. However, the can of coke in Derek's hand suddenly exploded. It sent out a very familiar and bright light. It looks like a can of coke, but it's actually another modified explosive. Derek burst into tears, proudly introducing the new variant of coke. Angela. Dot. 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 Despite losing her vision, Angela continued to raise her fist and punch around Derek's location according to her memory. However, Derek had expected this reaction long ago, and he, like a lazy man, rolled to the left, and at the same time took out the shotgun that had been hanging on his back. He put his half-recovered arm against the barrel, and assumed a standard shooting posture, pulling the trigger in Angela's direction after a lot of effort. Boom. Even with Angela's ability, from such a close range, the shooting power of the shotgun, still knocked Angela back a few steps and the pain in her ribs made her groan. Finally broke her defense. Derek's heart skipped a beat, and as his sight recovered, he mercilessly pulled the trigger and shot towards Angela several times. The continuous gunshots made Angela back away. The blind Angela could only be helpless and furious, passively accepting Derek's shooting. She couldn't understand why Derek, who was also affected by the flash, could still shoot so accurately and why he could still use a shotgun with huge amounts of recoil even after his arm was broken. Only Francis, who was fighting with Wade, noticed Derek's rapidly recovering arm. It was even faster than Wade's self-healing ability. Chapter 41 At first Francis thought that Derek's mutant ability was something related to his unbelievable marksmanship. So, he wanted Angela to deal with him quickly, and then control the troublesome Wade. After all, Wade's healing ability was really annoying. Even if the neck was cut with an axe, it would return to normal in some time so, the longer Angela took to deal with Derek, the worse things would get for Francis. But now, he unexpectedly discovered that Derek also possesses self-healing ability. And the speed of his recovery was fast, even faster than Wade's. 2. Self-healing mutants Francis's expression remained unchanged, but his heart was in turmoil. He wondered, since when did self-healing ability become so common? Looking at the armed soldiers who were almost all killed by Wade, Francis yelled at the beaten down Angela. That Jackie Chan also has self-healing ability. Don't think about killing him, find a way to control that guy. However, Angela, who had been deafened by a coke, only heard a buzzing sound. Mistaking Francis's voice as Derek mocking herself, Angela furiously yelled, Shut up, you puny little bug. Francis. Dot. 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 Did I say something wrong? Ha! Huh, women. Derek smiled cheerfully. Without interrupting their loving conversation, he reloaded his shotgun leisurely, and then shot at Angela again. Angela was shot many times, so much so that her ribs were broken, but her sight still hadn't recovered, so she could only accept the beating with her head covered by her arms. For some reason, Derek had the feeling as if he was fighting Kingpin. They looked the same anyhow. Derek fired all the shots at once and looked at Angela, who had broken many bones in different parts of her body, but still hadn't lost her fighting will. Derek was a little surprised. I have to say, her mutant ability is damn good. Derek didn't feel it when he watched the movie, but when she really appeared in front of his eyes, Derek realized how much her abilities defied the heavens. A mere strength and body could make guns, that human beings rely on, completely useless. What about those people with even weirder and more special abilities out there? Derek sighed, then took out a few grenades, and threw them at Angela's feet. Boom. The grenade exploded instantly, and Angela was overturned to the ground, with bloody wounds all over her body. She was not as tough as she imagined herself to be, only a few grenades disintegrated her whole defense. Angela lay trembling on the ground. Did this guy hide an arsenal up in his ass? You're not dead yet. Just how strong is your body? Derek, who possessed the self-healing ability, said so and took off his jacket leisurely, revealing a C4 bomb inside. Yes, he had a C4 bomb strapped to him the whole time once again. To deal with Angela, 
Derek had already prepared a unique set of equipment before leaving. Among them, the most powerful was the C4 bomb. He has already seen its power in the warehouse, and this time he deliberately increased the power of the explosives, fearing that he would not kill such a thick-skinned tank with a normal C4. The moment Angela opened her eyes, which were now swollen like walnuts and managed to recover a small portion of vision, Angela saw a C4 bomb drop in front of her, frantically beeping, and its light bright red. Oh, fuck me. Boom. A deafening explosion resounded through the ship. With Angela as the center, flames and smoke soared into the sky, forming a small mushroom around it. Hearing the explosion, Francis and Wade looked back at the same time. They saw a scorched black corpse fall from the air to the ground, covered with various scars. Then, they saw Derek approaching, looking at the two of them in surprise and said, You're not finished yet. Damn slow bitch, I've finished her. Wade replied, slashing towards Francis with his katana wildly. Damn you Jude, you're embarrassing me in front of my dish soap friend, and Vanessa broke Jude. Francis's expression twisted as he thought, it's an embarrassment for me to be alive. Bang bang. Two bullets escaped with a spark as Francis was shot in both his legs and fell to the ground. Derek, give me a little more time and I will kill him alone. I don't need your help at all. Wade looked at Derek. You sure? Derek pointed to Vanessa, who was watching the show, hanging on the ship all the while. After your girlfriend finds out about you, and remembers that you didn't save her, but focused on fighting with a man, what do you think will happen? Oh damn, fuck me. F parenthesis dot author's note. I'm not a bad choice I mean, it's Ryan Reynolds, not my fault. Wade threw away his katanas and ran towards Vanessa with brisk steps. Vanessa, wait for me, I'm here to save you. Ignoring Wade's stupidity, Derek walked to Francis and poked him on the head with his pistol, long time no see, dish soap. How are you doing? Francis looked at Derek expressionlessly. After Angela died, he knew that the situation was out of his hands. He knew he could not deal with them alone, unless... Chapter 42 I didn't expect you to have the same self-healing ability as that idiot. No wonder you survived the explosion, Francis said without any trace of panic or fear on his face. He already knew that whatever he did, the end result would be death, and he is not afraid of death at all. To be honest, I am quite envious of you guys. I was a victim of the research institute myself. Unfortunately, my mutant ability was not as powerful. It just enhanced my reaction ability and my physical fitness. Although I don't feel any pain, my wounds don't heal instantly. Francis grinned like a victor. You should be grateful to me. I let you obtain this ability. This is the ability that many people dash. Screw you. You piece of shit. Derek slammed the butt of the gun on Francis's head and said fiercely, I, Derek, became strong by my own efforts. I did not require any external help from you. I'm just better. Wasn't he just an ordinary person before he met me though? What hard work. It's all the credit of my study and experiments. Derek then recalled that Francis was only the manager of the research institute and not the real final boss of the research institute. So he couldn't help asking curiously, since you are not the head of the research institute, who is the person behind the research institute? He, do you think I'll tell you? I think you should. Derek looked at Francis and thought about it. You don't feel any pain, right? It's okay. I have plenty of solutions other than torture. For example, I can put you in a completely closed coffin with only a little oxygen cylinder and then bury you in the ground so that you are completely isolated from the outside world. There would be no light, no sound, and you can't even feel the passage of time. There would only be endless darkness around you. Darkness and silence. It is said that no one can retain their mind for more than five days in this situation. If your nerves do get damaged, I'll find a mutant who can repair your nerves then. Then, I can do whatever I want. Hum, I'll start with making you do a 360 degree split. The more Derek talked, the more excited he got. In the end, he rubbed his palms together as if eager to try the split. The threat did work for Francis this time, though. He felt that if he didn't answer Derek with his honorable and gentleman-like personality, he would definitely complete his promise and do this kind of thing maybe with some improvisation too. I only know that I work for a company named Essex and I am responsible for managing the operations of several research institute branches. And regarding the higher-ups of the company, I don't have any idea, Francis said. 
He anyways only worked for the money, and had no sense of loyalty to the people above him. S6. Derek pondered. If he remembers correctly, this company has appeared in several mutant movies. It was a company that collected mutant genes. Among their collection, they have Wolverine's genes, and the Wolverine's clone was the product they created using them. Generally speaking, they could be regarded as a villain organization. So, the story here involves mutants and their genes, A. Eh? F parenthesis dot author's note. No shit, Sherlock. Derek didn't care about the events anymore. After all, he was not a mutant, his abilities were all given to him by his titles, and have nothing to do with the mutant ability at all. By the way, the serum you injected me back then needed adrenaline as a catalyst, right? Derek asked and Francis nodded silently. Derek was thoughtful. It seemed that the serum had no effect on him as a traverser. There was no measure of how much adrenaline his body had secreted every time he entered bullet time. If the serum had to affect him, it would have already. At this time, Wade came over to Wade and his girlfriend Vanessa. Seeing that Wade had taken off his mask, Derek knew that he had confessed to Vanessa, and now he probably wanted Francis to restore his disfigured face. But, Derek knew this was impossible. Derek threw Francis over to Wade and said, I'll leave this guy to you. I'll pick up the equipment that can still be used. I'm running out of them. Seeing that there were still tons of grenades and magazines hanging on Derek's body, Wade was a bit lost. This wasn't exactly running out. Ten minutes later, Derek came back dragging a lot of guns and ammunition. He had also found a motorcycle on his way. He then saw Francis's body lying on the ground with a bloody hole in his forehead. Oh, well, don't it all most nice though. Motherfucker. This shit can't fix my face. Wade yelled angrily as if he didn't feel satisfied. He raised his foot and kicked Francis's body. During this long period, he was frantically looking for Francis. Just to heal his face. But after working so hard for so long, he got a sentence. I cannot do it. With his temper, he shot Francis without any delay. F parenthesis dot author's note. What if he wasn't done and had one more sentence? Derek patted him on the shoulder and comforted Wade. Think about it, although you are a little ugly, at least you aren't dying from cancer now. Or, do you want to visit another research institute? Wade, dot, 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 Vanessa, dot, dot, dot. Vanessa glanced at Wade, although she didn't expect much from the start, none of the men around Wade was normal. Chapter 43. After Francis died, Derek and Wade went their ways and left the deck. Wade called the friendly Indian driver again unable to resist the temptation of taking Vanessa home. Due to the fresh batch of firearms and ammunition, Derek did not take a taxi back with Wade, but drove all the way back to his apartment on the motorcycle he had just found. On the way, he began to think about more ways to get stronger. After today's battle, Derek found that his plan of burning bald was not strong enough, and in the end, he had to use the Al-Qaeda version of the C4 bomb to kill Gina. According to the plan he had made originally, the shotgun should have completely broken Gina's defense, and then used some grenades to kill her off. But conversely, even a powerful gun like a shotgun, with firepower, could not break through her physical defense. Derek had gained a new understanding of his abilities, and therefore, he must quickly increase the damage dealt by his weapons. And, he should at least buy a bazooka. Sun Tzu said the right thing. The only answer to violence in this world has always been more violence. F parenthesis dot author's note. Sun Tzu. Bitch, when did I say that? Derek has always been a reasonable person, a preacher of truth, and he hopes that his enemies can understand this truth. I came to my senses, and I realized that I could and should contribute more to the world, other than making weapons. So, I declare that the Stark Industries Weapons Division, effective immediately, will shut down until I find new goals for the company and other directions that I feel are right, which also lie in the best interests of the nation and. On the TV screen of a bar, a man with a beard stood on the stage, whilst giving a speech. This person was the CEO of Stark Industries, Anthony Edward Stark. The stock of Stark Industries had plummeted since Tony Stark disappeared, and most people assumed that he died in Afghanistan. As a result of that assumption, they never expected that Tony Stark would appear in everyone's field of vision again. While Tony Stark disappeared and reappeared, Stark Industries' main profit was from the arms business. But now that Stark Industries' arms department would be shut down, 
Almost half of the Stark Industries profit source was gone. Everyone was shocked by Tony's announcement, especially the investors who saw Tony's return as an opportunity, and began to grab shares like madmen. The weasel wiped the wine glass in his hand, feeling a little weird and said, This Tony Stark must have been brainwashed by those terrorists. An arms dealer will now not sell arms. So, what now? Is he planning to sell beer now? Derek drank the rebel can and said calmly, Maybe he will now become a smith. Title obtain chance. Unlock condition. Defeat Tony Stark's battle suit once using a high-tech battle suit made by yourself. 0 slash 1. Title. Super high school level inventor. Without any warning, the system suddenly popped up with new content after a long while of no appearance. Another new title. Derek was a little surprised. So far, he has only triggered two title tasks. Each title task appeared to him randomly, and there was never a time limit. Now, it was the third time he had triggered the title obtaining mission without wishing for it. However, when Derek saw the content of the obtainment task clearly, he almost sprayed the Red Bull on the weasel's face. Excuse me, what in the actual fuck? Beat Stark's battle suit with one built by yourself. Are you sure you are not kidding me? Derek was dumbfounded. This was the first time that the mission was directly related to one single person. Even more outrageous was the task's fulfillment condition. You want me to defeat the Tony Stark? He's a freaking godlike person of this Marvel Universe. A Batman who is always ready. He doesn't need preparation time because he is always fucking prepared. Derek estimated that the cost of a single Iron Man suit made by Tony Stark was at least hundreds of millions of United States dollars. This is clearly him burning his money. With the help of his position as one of the richest people in the world, Tony Stark had dozens of armor. Others played with drones, but no one was able to make a perfect suit. Tony Stark, he tweaks his high-tech battle suit and makes it more powerful as time goes on. In the later stages of the world, he could even go against someone like Hulk. Later on, even Thanos knows how to fight this freaking human. And, most importantly, Derek didn't know how to make any high-tech battle suits. With his level of knowledge, he could at most make a suit with restricted movements, which, compared to Tony Stark's let's not talk about it. And, another thing to consider was the kind of material used by Tony for his suits, which, by the way, were all top-notch materials. If Derek tried to make such a kind of armor, he estimated that only his brain would collapse. But the biggest problem was not that he couldn't use his brains to fight Tony. He was afraid that Tony Stark would die laughing on the spot after seeing his suit. Well, it is no use getting demotivated before we even start, I believe. The first thing should be as Derek was cheering himself up, he heard Wessel say, close quote anyhow, who are we to say anything? He's too rich and influential for us to compare ourselves. This son of a. Chapter 44. For the first two title tasks he had come across, Derek felt that he could at least see a possibility of completing them. But for this new task, Derek couldn't think of any method to get it done. Among other things, with Tony Stark's identity and background, Derek really couldn't just barge into his house and go see 4 Boom Boom casually. Fortunately, the task was not mandatory or time limited. He had a lot of time to figure out a solution. Compared to this, Derek had a problem that needed urgent solving. He didn't have any money in his pockets. After buying a large number of firearms and ammunition, Derek's bank balance was nearing zero. He only had enough money to go on with his normal life for a few days, but it was completely impossible for him to buy any kind of weapons. Derek looked at Weasel and asked, Is there any high-paying commission recently? I am in an urgent need of money. Derek asked straight for the highest paying commission. He knew how good his skills were now, he did not need to be a mere meat shield anymore. His shooting technique was perfect for assassination, just like the perfect assassination he performed a few days ago. The police could neither find any traces of him nor any witness. After all, dead people could not be witnesses. Weasel nodded. He now had a general understanding of Derek's skills, and didn't say anything about the difficulty of the commission. Yes, but those high-paying commissions are first of all not simple assassinations relating to a single person. They are on a different level, like the extermination of Mexican drug cartels. If you want to do it, the location is Exaca and Mexico. In Colorado, there should be more commissions like this one. You might even find some Area 51 invasion missions there. Nah, tell me something closer, preferably within New York. 
Derek resolutely vetoed it. He did not intend to travel so far just to complete a single commission. In New York, there are a few high-paying commissions Weasel thought for a while, and then finally spoke. But, that commission is on your head. But, good news, the reward is now down to 4 million. Derek was a little surprised. Could it be that the gangsters figured out my identity? Weasel scoffed and then explained, the reward was high because your identity was not known. But now, the reward has been lowered because your accomplice was caught. You mean, the Punisher was caught? Derek frowned. His accomplice was Frank, and he shouldn't have gotten caught so easily. Yes, what a poor guy. People who mess with gangs usually end up miserably. If I fell into the hands of those crazy gangsters, I would definitely commit suicide rather than bear the torture. Speaking of this, Weasel looked at Derek worriedly. You have to be careful, maybe your information has already been revealed to the gangsters by that Punisher. I hope you were not idiot enough to reveal your address. And if you did, I beg you, move out as soon as possible, and move to Wade's place. Weasel didn't want the apartment to be bumped by gangsters who came to find Derek. Who's going to live with me? A frivolous voice came and Wade, wearing a mask, came over and sat down beside Derek. I warn you, don't even think about it. No one can disturb my peaceful cozy life with Vanessa except the IRS. Weasel said sarcastically, Oh, look who is here, America's most handsome boyfriend Wade Wilson. I thought you would hold Vanessa all the time now. What are you doing here? Derek was also surprised to see Wade coming. Since Wade and Vanessa got back together, the long lost couple were together every day, and even his friends hardly saw Wade these days. That's what I thought too. But there's one thing scarier than the IRS coming to you. And that happened to me, Wade said. F parenthesis dot author's note. Worse than the IRS happened question mark dot 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 dot. My dog stepped on a bee. What's the matter? I'm out of money. Wade shrugged his shoulders and lay down on the table dejectedly. Are you short of money too? Derek asked curiously. Very fucking much. Although Wade became a mercenary earlier than Derek, his savings weren't a lot. Thinking of the increasing expenses of himself and Vanessa recently, Wade said eagerly, quickly get me some new jobs, preferably within New York, so that I can work in the morning and hug my Vanessa in the evening. Hearing this, Derek suddenly had an idea. Wade, here is a commission with several million United States dollars. Are you interested in doing it? Millions of United States dollars. Wade suddenly became interested and immediately asked, and what are the contents of this million dollar commission? I'll do anything other than remove my mask. It's simple. You have to just catch a guy and hand him over to a gang and get paid millions of dollars. There is such a good commission. Wade asked impatiently, who is the target and where is he in New York? Who am I going to catch and barter for millions? Don't worry. There is no difficulty in this commission. Moreover, you also know the target closely, and the distance is almost nothing. I know them. Who is it? I, your bedmate. Derek gulped down another Red Bull at once, and showed a bright smile on his face. Let's do it. I won't resist at all, but, the share will be 50-50. Chapter 45. Above the pitch black sky, gloomy black clouds blocked the moonlight, casting an eerie shadow over the desolate landscape below. The darkness seemed to be alive, creeping slowly and enveloping everything in its path. The dazzling lights of the city in the distance shone like a beacon in the pitch black night sky, casting an offerably glow over the lifeless West Midtown. The stark contrast between the two was like a boundary line between the living and the dead, separated only by the Hudson River. This was the cradle of criminals, the infamous Hell's Kitchen. On a quiet street, several black vehicles parked at the corner. A group of Russian men led by Vladimir stepped out of the sleek black vehicles, their polished shoes clicking against the pavement as they walked towards Wesley standing in front of the Iron Gate. The sound of steps echoed through the silent street, making the atmosphere tense. Vladimir's eyes were sharp as he scanned his surroundings. Where's the damn attacker? Please don't worry. Since you agreed to a future assistance, what my employer promised to you would naturally be completed. Wesley smiled. Immediately afterwards, he nodded to the black-clothed bodyguards standing behind him. The bodyguards turned around and quickly opened the large iron gate behind them. The heavy iron gate was pushed open with a light thud in the end as a faint smell of blood rushed over. 
The space inside the establishment was very small. It was surrounded by iron walls, and in the center was a burly man. Vladimir saw that the man's hands and feet were tied with iron chains. His body and clothes were covered in red blood, as if he had just been fished out of a vampire's lunch bowl. Judging from his wounds, these bloodstains should not all belong to him. Vladimir said to himself as he finished observing the man. Seeing this man, Wesley couldn't help sighing. This is the famous Punisher. We spent a lot of effort to lure him out and catch him. Even so, we have lost a lot here. But please rest assured, according to our agreement, he is yours, so we didn't torture him at all. Vladimir did not reply, but stared hard at Frank sitting in front of him. Previously, the Russian Ross gang also sent out a large number of men to catch him. The result? They encountered various obstacles every time they acted, and Frank always managed to slip away in the end. Vladimir, being not a fool, knew that someone was trying to stop him from catching Frank. Under pressure, Vladimir had finally agreed to Wesley's suggestion, giving up Anatoly's former territory, and handing it over to them, while they assisted in the operation. It wasn't long after his agreement that Vladimir received a call saying that Frank had been caught. Vladimir walked up to Frank, pulled his face up with his hair and asked coldly, You killed Anatoly. Frank looked up at Vladimir calmly. He recognized Vladimir, the leader of the Russian Ross gang. Curling his lips in disdain, Frank definitely knew who the murderer of Anatoly was. But he didn't care about it. Now, he didn't bother if the blame fell on him or not, he just mocked Vladimir. I killed a lot of cunts, and they were all guilty. Which one are you talking about? Anatoly, might have met him. Enraged, Vladimir punched through. The veins in Vladimir's neck bulged as he grabbed Frank's collar. I know you have a companion. Tell me where he is. Frank spat saliva and put on a mocking expression. The result was that Vladimir beat up Frank violently, and Frank didn't even squeak during the whole process. After beating Frank to a mess, Vladimir snarled. Tell me who that damn companion is, and what his name is. If you don't, I swear on my life that you will die a terrible death. Frank opened his swollen blue eyes, calmly watching Vladimir roaring at him helplessly. Frank was a trained soldier. He was not afraid of any kind of cruel torture. Since he and Derek had only met once, this was not to protect him, but Frank just wanted to see the anger of these gangsters. So, to enjoy it more, he did not reveal the slightest bit of information about Derek. Frank said in a hoarse voice, You're not going to find him ever, I think. Vladimir punched him again. Seeing that Frank was so stubborn, Vladimir turned to Wesley angrily. Tell me, where is the other bastard who was with him? We're currently investigating that. Wesley said as he pushed back his glasses. However, according to their plan, once they find the second attacker, they will find someone to silence him directly, rather than leaving this to Vladimir. It's just that Vladimir also lost a big part of his territory. How could he listen to such nonsense? Vladimir raised his blood-stained palm and grabbed Wesley's collar unceremoniously. If you take my territory, you have to send the assailant over to, and I want them both to die at my hands. Wesley frowned, you also know that it will take time. After all, it's not like the other attacker would just be delivered to the gate right now, Dash. Just then, a member of the Russian Ross gang came running over. The assailant was found, boss. Someone came and said that he caught the person whose head had the large reward. They say that they saw him when they were going to relieve themselves in the toilet. They have come here to deliver him and receive the reward. Wesley, what the Dash? Frank, dot, dot, dot. Chapter 46. Half an hour later. The large iron gate was pushed open, accompanied by a loud creaking sound. The first person to walk in was a strange man in black and red tights, wearing a red mask on his face. The man in tights held a rope in his hands, and behind him was another man, getting dragged by him. The man getting dragged on the ground, also wore a mask not a mask, but rather, it looked like a walnut bag wrapped on the man's head. The man in red tights, Wade, looked around the room saw the gangsters and Frank in the room, who was covered in blood. Wade then enthusiastically and happily greeted them. Hey, are you having a red attire theme party here? May I join too? Vladimir walked forward and looked at Wade. Is he the one who was asked to look for in the commission? Looking at your villainous appearance and using my genius brain. I knew you were the boss here, right? Wade grabbed the rope and pulled the man behind him forward, with his arms akimbo. He said, that's right. 
I brought the man worth 4 million. He is the one who was asked for. F parenthesis dot author's note. Akimbo is when someone has their hands on their hips, and the elbows are turned outwards. Wesley narrowed his eyes slightly. He was shrewd, and quickly noticed that something was wrong. He asked, you said he was the one who was asked for. How can you prove that he is the one? Moreover, how did you find his identity? There were almost no clues. Facing Wesley's questioning, Wade did not panic, but talked eloquently. This matter started with a Mexican chicken wrap. I ate a Mexican chicken wrap on the street today. And it didn't take long before I suddenly felt a severe pain in my stomach. So, after that, I found a toilet. Shut up and get to the point. Vladimir interrupted him impatiently. Wade shrugged him and continued. At that time, I saw a man in the toilet who exactly matched the description on the commission. And so, I caught him here. As he spoke, he took off the man's mask and revealed Derek's super handsome face. The expressions of Vladimir and Wesley froze instantly. They remembered the description of the other attacker on the bounty, which seemed to be only one simple word. Asian, likely Jackie Chan. Looking at Derek's face again, it really fit the description perfectly but, Vladimir's complexion was very bad, and now, he seriously suspected that the man who was tied up was a passerby that the man in tights randomly grabbed while going to the toilet. He said in a rude tone, I need some better proof. If you can't prove this guy's identity as the assailant, I will believe it that you are mocking me, and you will die a death worse than you can imagine. Oh, calm down please. I definitely can prove that he is the one. How will you prove it? Wesley continued to question Wade. If the person in front of him was a faker, he could expose their identities on the spot. If this person was the real one, even so, he must be identified as a fake. Wesley could not let the real attacker fall into Vladimir's hands. Wade poked Derek's waist with his fingers and made a fierce expression on his face regardless of whether others could see his face under the mask. He asked him, quickly tell me, are you really the one who had his name written on the bounty? Quote, Derek showed an expression of panic, his eyes revealing a hint of disbelief. You actually discovered me. I must say, you're an intelligent lad. What a meticulous judgment. You're right. I'm the man who was on the bounty of 4 million. Wade nodded and spread his arms in front of everyone and said, You heard it. Wesley. Dot. 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 Vladimir. Dot. 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 Frank. Dot. 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 Frank, who sat on the torture chair, thought the wounds on his body were painful at first, but now, his head hurt more. When Derek's mask was taken off, Although he didn't realize why he put on a fake beard and wore a pair of glasses, Frank still recognized Derek at a glance. After seeing that Derek was really caught, Frank was surprised. His role as a punisher was too famous, and all criminals knew that his target was criminals. So the group of gangsters set up a trap to lure him out. But Derek's situation was completely different from his. Originally, not much of his information was revealed. Even if this group of gangsters covered almost the entire New York intelligence network, it would be difficult for them to find Derek's traces under such a huge amount of information gap. Frank originally thought that Derek fell into the hands of a powerful intelligence organization and was captured by the opponent after a life and death struggle. Frank had already imagined all kinds of fierce battle scenes in his mind. But now it seems, this kid is clearly on a self-destruct command. It's like he has a C4 tied to his body, and would take all these gangsters down with him. In his many years of interrogation career, it was the first time that Frank saw such an easy prisoner. In less than half a minute, Derek revealed everything about himself. Frank took a deep breath, still holding a glimmer of hope in his heart. Although he had a bird brain teammate, Derek's identity was still a little uncertain. After all, the two of them were outsiders, even if they admit to it themselves. There was no real way to prove whether what they said was true. And Vladimir also thought of this. He really wanted to catch the murderer, but he didn't want to spend a lot of money to kill a random passerby who wasn't even a murderer. Pointing to Derek, Vladimir asked, Use the life you have left in your shell and tell me, is he the Asian guy you saw that day? Vladimir said it to a Russian guy sitting in a wheelchair, his one eye covered with a bandage and half his body in plasters. He was the one and only person who survived. He looked at Derek and then, he nodded confidently. Aye, it's him. I remember. That beard. Frank, has anyone survived this kid too? Moreover, beard. They are all stupid shits. 
Chapter 47. Call them all here, Vladimir ordered. One by one, all the survivors of that night, especially the ones that Derek saved Frank from with his riding skills, came ahead and identified Derek. Seeing that Derek was more and more being accused of being the attacker, Wesley realized that if he didn't do anything, their plan would go wrong. So, Wesley said, with all due respect, I don't think these statements can provide us with anything concrete against him. Oh, really now? Are you saying that my men are telling lies? Vladimir stared at Wesley closely. Wesley's attitude and approach to this situation made him a little suspicious. Or, could it be that you don't want me to find out who killed my brother? That's definitely not it. You may have misunderstood me. Regarding the situation that night, I just don't want to rule out the possibility that your men might recognize wrong. I just want it all to be 100% confirmed. After all, my employer also has to pay a fat bounty. Wesley explained calmly. I'm not mistaken. He's the Asian guy. I remember that black beard. The Russian men tried to explain that there was nothing wrong with his eyes and memories. Frank, meanwhile, was silent all this while. He didn't know what to say. He was in the same situation as Matt a few days ago. Being a smart man was trouble when sitting where he was. I won't claim that my memory is the best but beard. Are you for real? Vladimir said coldly. Then how do you want his identity to be proved? I heard that you lost a lot of people that night, and most of them were taken care of by the Asian attacker. From that we know that the Asian guy is for sure very skilled. Wesley smiled confidently, and turned to look at Derek. But look at this man. His figure doesn't look like he has received professional training. I don't think he has the strength to do any killing. He might just die from if he sees a real gun. Hearing that his own strength was questioned, Derek was not at all happy. Oi bitch, what do you mean? You little red four-eyed riding hood motherfucking cunt. Are you doubting my strength by saying that Punisher? Tell them quickly. What happened that night? Wesley took a deep breath to keep himself calm. He didn't ask anything wrong and did not insult him. But this guy exploded with rage suddenly. He wondered if this guy was short-tempered. Why did you appear here? Frank asked. He had seen Derek's strength and knew about it. With his weird self-healing ability and unpredictable marksmanship, he couldn't have gotten caught. Derek said seriously, Ah fuck, why is everyone so dumb? Can't you tell that I'm here to save you? Looking at Derek who was tied up with a rope and had to jump dozens of times to move, Frank was expressionless. Sorry. I really can't see it. Seeing Derek stand on the situation that night and the expression of familiarity on Frank's face, Vladimir knew that the person in front of him was the other attacker, and suddenly, he was about to punch Derek's face in rage. But right before his fist could make contact with Derek's face, a cold light flashed and a sharp long blade stopped in front of Vladimir's neck. Ignoring all the gangsters who panicked and raised their guns, Wade held the katana in his hand confidently and said in a dissatisfied tone, This is against the rules. Before you pay the money, he is still my man. You have to get my consent to do it in front of so many people. That's right. Derek hid behind Wade and shouted, as if he had found a defender. Feeling the coldness on his neck, Vladimir's body froze for an instant and his intuition told him that the person in front of him was definitely not a normal mob. The threat of death made him forcefully suppress the anger in his heart. Wire him the money. Vladimir ordered a subordinate beside him with a gloomy face. In less than half a minute, Wade's cell phone vibrated. It was a message from Weasel saying that the bounty money had been transferred. However, he looked at the phone screen and suddenly exclaimed angrily, This amount is very wrong. Why is there only 2.5 million United States dollars? Where did the other 1.5 go? Noticing that Katana was still on his neck, Vladimir sullenly looked at Wesley. Wesley frowned slightly. The development of this matter was completely out of his control now. I need to report this to my employer. Wade was too lazy to listen to the nonsense. He waved another Katana and pointed it at Wesley, chattering endlessly, Four eyes, you should learn to be independent, now that you're a grown-up. Now is the best opportunity to practice being independent for the first time. Transfer the money that is rightfully mine. And, don't forget to transfer the tuition fees for helping you become independent. I see. After a brief silence, Wesley transferred the remaining money. As he spoke, his eyes gradually turned cold. It is not so easy to take money from their gangsters. Looking at Vladimir's gloomy face, 
It was obvious that he did not intend to let Wade go. After he heard so many things here that should not have been heard, how could they let him be? However, the bounty that should have been paid still needs to get paid. After all, it is a bounty issued by them publicly. Swallowing the bounty would only affect their reputation. No one would be willing to cooperate with them in the future. This is good boy. Well, you are now his person. The mobile phone received another money transfer notification as Wade put away his katanas in satisfaction, while letting go of the rope and pushed Derek over. Vladimir frowned. Wesley immediately sensed something was wrong. He stepped back a few steps and said in surprise, shoot them right now. However, Derek moved faster than them. Two pistols suddenly appeared in his lowered hands, and his pupils suddenly contracted. Bang. The sound of the gunshots were not loud. All the gangsters and bodyguards in the house fell to the ground. Blood flowed from the holes on their foreheads. And the other remnants who were waiting outside the door rushed into the house when they heard the gunshots but were wiped out by Wade. Within a few seconds, all the gangsters were wiped out, only Vladimir and Wesley remained alive in the large room. Oh, Frank too. Chapter 48. Within moments, the room was turned into a morgue full of corpses, the smell of blood permeating through the air. No gang members other than Wesley and Vladimir were left alive. Under the dim light, the blood stains on the ground reflected a sharp scarlet light. Seeing that the people they brought were wiped out immediately, Vladimir and Wesley's complexions turned pale. When Wade killed several intruders, the two understood that they were together. It's not that they didn't think about this possibility at first, but when they saw that there were only two people on the other side, they relaxed their vigilance. They never thought that only two people could kill all of them in such a short period of time. Jude, you are such a genius. You have earned us four million United States dollars. This is much easier than when I ran around the world to make money. Wade pushed Katana back into its sheath on his back and looked at the phone happily. He and Derek split the bounty 50-50. This huge sum of money is enough for Derek and Wade to be cool for a long time. Derek patted his head suddenly. They were sloppy. If I knew it would be so easy, I would have caught the Punisher together to claim the bounty. Then we could earn at least 1.5 million United States dollars more each. What a bloody loss. Frank, dot, dot, dot. By the way, untie him first. Derek seemed to have just remembered the existence of Frank, and was about to untie him, only to find that there was still a lock on the iron chain binding him. Where's the key to the lock? On him. Frank glanced at Wesley. Derek nodded, walked over to Wesley and started searching without taking any consent. Wesley's face got very ugly. He now knew that this Asian was not an ordinary mercenary. The strength shown by him was definitely beyond the scope of normal people. I think we can talk. If you want to, don't touch that. The keys are in the left pocket of my suit. If you didn't tell me, your that was finished. Derek took out the key from his pocket and took out other things inside. Hey, what is this? This thing is known as my wallet. Don't talk nonsense. I found it first. Derek decisively stuffed the wallet into his trouser pocket. Wesley, dot, dot, dot. At this moment, Vladimir beside him suddenly exploded. Taking advantage of the moment when Derek was not paying attention, Vladimir raised the revolver he had prepared and pulled the trigger several times at Wade in front of him. Wade fell to the ground with a loud sound. Immediately afterwards, Vladimir pointed his gun at Derek and roared with a cruel smile. Damn Asian, you are dead. Facing the black muzzle of the gun, Derek smiled confidently. I counted it, and your bullets have been exhausted. I bet you have no bullets in your gun. Bang. Derek smiled at Vladimir, tilted his head and slowly fell to the ground. Ha 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 ha, you idiot. I still had a bullet in my gun. Looking at the two corpses on the ground, Vladimir suddenly had a sense of accomplishment of winning against the wind, and laughed wantonly. F parenthesis dot author's note. All right. I had no problem editing names from Jaquin to Vladimir. But here, Vladimir was straight up given as Vladimilton. This situation was now completely reversed, and Wesley was both surprised and happy. But soon, these emotions all turned into fear, because he saw that the two corpses moved by themselves. Contrary to the terrified Wesley, Frank's expression was much better. He saw the man in tights, who had been shot several times, stand up again. Obviously, he had the same self-healing ability as Derek. What the hell? Is this kind of ability available wholesale? How can everyone come back from the dead? Frank saw Derek sit up abruptly. 
grabbed the gun and Vladimir's hand pointed the muzzle at his newly healed forehead and said viciously, I don't believe it, come again, my mass ain't that bad. This time, I bet there are no bullets in your gun. Seeing the dead man suddenly revive, Vladimir's mind went blank, and he subconsciously pulled the trigger. Click click click. Derek smiled triumphantly, then raised his pistol and pointed it at Vladimir's head. It's your turn now, guess if there is any bullet in my gun. Vladimir swallowed. Yes, I bet there are bullets. I don't think so dash. Bang. Looking at Vladimir's fallen body, Derek said angrily, Damn it, you won again. Ignoring Wesley, who was lying aside, Derek picked up the key and walked over to unlock the chain for Frank. Looking at Frank with a bruised nose and swollen face resembling a pig's head, Derek hesitated for a few seconds, took out his walnut bag mask, and said thoughtfully, Take it. You need this. I'm afraid your face will be recognized by those criminals, and they will not be able to help but laugh when they see you in the future. After all, since Frank is a brutal and iron-blooded tough guy, which was very dependent on his image, walking around with a funny face would be bad. Frank looked down at the plastic bag with two small holes poked in it, and a meat discount sticker on the back. Frank kept a straight face and didn't accept the plastic bag. He would rather wear this pig's face than wear this vile mask. If I walk around with that sticker on my back, I won't exactly be safe. Chapter 49 Vladimir is now dead. Wesley's plans were completely disrupted. To make the matter worse, he had now fallen into the hands of the two weirdos. Wait, I think we can talk things out. Wesley couldn't help but say, he felt that if he waited any longer, it would be too late, he had to be in control of the situation. Derek's eyes lit up as he asked, you want to negotiate? If yes, you are very welcome to do so. I like negotiating a lot. So, how much is your life worth? Are you going to pay a few hundred million for it? Wesley choked suddenly. Hundreds of millions. Do you think I'm a Stark? However, seeing that Derek didn't shoot him, Wesley secretly heaved a sigh of relief. Derek's words made him at least see the possibility of negotiation. Wesley brewed his emotions and showed a characteristic smile. Actually, there is a very good relationship between us. I am the employer of that commission, and I hired you to disrupt the drug trade of the Russian Ross gang. You remember back then, you were the one. Derek looked at Wesley. I don't believe it. How can you prove it? Good lord, a few minutes ago, Derek had to prove that he was Frank's assailant. And now, it was Wesley's turn to prove that he was the one who put up the commission. Wesley said helplessly, the entrustment fee was 100,000, and the place and time of the transaction were provided. Okay, it really turned out to be you. I caught you. Derek's eyes widened as he said angrily, because of your fucking 100,000 United States dollars. I messed with so many people, and the leader of the Russian Ross gang was even after my life, you bitch. Do you know how scared I was all this time? Wesley glanced at Vladimir's cold body and thought, you killed him because you were afraid. If you are not satisfied with the remuneration, we can renegotiate. How much? Wesley tentatively said, I will pay you three times. Only that much. Punisher, this poor guy with no money will be handed over to you. Derek curled his lips in disdain. Now that he has two million United States dollars, he puts his pride above money. Hearing Derek's words, Frank, who was covered in blood, picked up a gun on the ground, walked slowly to Wesley, and said in a cold voice like a demon crawling out of hell, anyone who is guilty shall be punished. Five five times. Five times the pay. Oh. Derek suddenly held down the gun in Frank's hand and stopped his next move. If he didn't hold it down, Frank would have definitely shot down Wesley. Frank tried to raise the pistol again, but found that Derek used a bit too much force. He looked at Derek expressionlessly. Are you going to let him go? I'm not sure. It all depends on him. Derek looked at Wesley with a smile. Five times the reward is still a bit low. Let's make it ten times the reward and make it a good and lucky number, right? It rose ten times directly, and Wesley wanted to cry without tears. I isn't this too much. Frank, boy, kill him. Frank raised his pistol again indifferently. Anyone who is dash. I agree. Ten times the reward. Oh. Frank took a deep breath. He decided not to say any lines next time. Just do it at once. Seeing that another one million United States dollars came in. Wade almost drooled. Jude. I know you are the best person. There must be my share in it, right? Derek said indifferently. 
I think you know wrong things then. He is an unscrupulous employer who embezzled the employee's money. This is the remuneration I deserve. What does it have to do with you? Oh exclamation point. Wade covered his cheeks exaggeratedly, as if he couldn't believe his teammates suddenly said such words. After a few seconds of delay, he pointed at Derek with trembling fingers. A, hey, are you sure you want to take the money all by yourself? It's all mine, it's mine. Damn it, you forced me. Wade roared, then looked at Wesley, transfer one million United States dollars to me. And I will help you get rid of this money-seeking bastard. Plus, I'll make sure you are alive. Wesley blinked in confusion, was there suddenly an internal strife? Frank glanced at Wade, he didn't let go of the finger holding the trigger. Once Wade made a move, he would immediately shoot and finish the opponent. You're going to betray me for this little money. Derek looked at Wade in disbelief. It was you who betrayed me first. Wade pulled out two katanas, with a very firm attitude, and asked Wesley, for eyes, tell me soon, you don't have much time. Seeing that Derek and Wade had a real dispute, Wesley was instantly ecstatic. This result couldn't be better. Only when the two fight with each other could he have a chance to escape. Wesley nodded without hesitation. Just when Wesley was expecting the two to fight, Derek suddenly pointed the gun at his head and said angrily, Okay? You guys are so bitchy that you would actually split our team. Let me tell you this once, four eyes, this time, without 15 times the remuneration. I will make sure you see the hell's entrance next. A hey, alright. I'll help you if I get 20 times of it. An extra 10 day security too. Oh okay. You know what if you give me. Wesley was taken aback and subconsciously looked at Wade, whom he had just temporarily hired until the next offer. He saw that Wade put away his katana, put his hands on the back of his head and whistled as if this whole situation had nothing to do with him. At the moment Wesley understood that this was not an internal strife, it was their day out fishing money. Chapter 50 These two bloody bastards! Exclamation point Wesley looked aggrieved. He had been forced to throw out his intention of controlling the situation long ago. Wesley observed that the two guys in front of him couldn't use their brains like normal people at all. He was able to talk and laugh when facing all other big gangs. But he was at a disadvantage when facing these two. Wesley took a deep breath and said, Okay, but I need to contact my employer. This extra money is not within my range of rights. And I can't make this decision. Seeing that Wesley's eyes didn't seem to be lying. Derek waved his hand, oh sure, but remember not to talk any other nonsense. Wesley silently took out a mobile phone from his suit and quickly dialed the number. He said a few words into the phone and only briefly explained the current situation. Under the gazes of two immortals and the Punisher, he didn't try to be a smart shit and reveal some information about any of them. After getting a reply from his employer, Wesley handed the phone to Derek. My employer wants to speak to you. Derek took the phone and greeted warmly. Hello, you must be the famous Wilson Fisk Arca Willie. Hello Mr. Mercenary. A steady voice came from the other end of the phone. It's a pity that we talk in this way. But it seems that there are some unnecessary misunderstandings between us. But I think this is a good opportunity for us to start our relationship anew. Unexpectedly for Derek, the underworld boss did not have the rude tone that he had expected him to have. His tone was slow and calm, completely unhurried, as if he could do this all day. Although I really want to cooperate with you and be friendly but, I'm in a hurry. Derek didn't intend to continue chatting with Kingpin, and said bluntly, 20 times the reward. If you wire me the money, I will let him go. If you don't it's pretty obvious I believe. I'll pay you 50 times as much. Kingpin said calmly, according to the previous procedures. Now I can transfer 2 million to your account. And after Wesley arrives at a safe place, I can transfer another 3 million. As long as you let Wesley go, you can get a total of 5 million United States dollars. And I will not count the previous bounties. What do you think of this deal? FK. King Pin's sudden throwing of coins made Derek a little confused. Hearing that there was no sound from the phone, Jing continued, You helped me get rid of Vladimir. I am very grateful to you. This is the reward you deserve. As I said, there are only some differences between us. And I want to correct them. Derek looked at the corpses of bodyguards all over the floor, nodded and said, Indeed. The actual conflict, the meaning of this sentence is a bit ambiguous. King Pin secretly wanted to silence Derek. But Derek secretly almost killed Wesley, his right-hand man. 
However, since this had not happened, there was indeed no real conflict between them. As for the bodyguards, the world is cruel. Compared to this, King Pin is more interested in Derek. Although he does not know what happened for the time being, judging from the results of the two battles Derek had participated in, it was obvious that the mercenary he hired was not a human. King Pen then said with great interest besides, I very much hope to reach a long-term cooperative relationship with someone with an ability like yours. If you are willing to serve me, I will give you a hefty compensation. During the speech, King Pen did not lose his show of sincerity and politeness. Putting away distracting thoughts, Derek said cheerfully, Sugar da dash arno, boss King Pen, I've already felt your sincerity but I'm not interested in being your subordinate. As for the remuneration you mentioned, I will reluctantly accept it. As Kingpin said, they just had some misunderstandings. Since Kingpin was so sincere and actively wanted to eliminate the misunderstanding, Derek was completely willing to accept it. I'm not a superhero, so this world can burn for all I care. Hearing Derek's refusal, Kingpin didn't bother dragging the matter and said, it's a pleasant corporation and I hope there will be opportunities to cooperate in the future. Yes, sir. After finishing speaking, Derek hung up the phone. After a while, he received the transfer notice. King Ping's wiring speed was pretty fast. Derek looked at Wesley. Oi, four eyes, your boss has already paid the ransom. You can leave now. My name is Wesley. Okay. Four eyes, I mean, let's go. Four eyes, Wesley. Wesley didn't dare to correct him and walked towards the iron gate. He didn't want to stay in this place for a second more. Looking at Wesley's back, Wade suddenly put forward his own idea. Oh Jude, why don't we follow this four-eyed boy secretly? And when he leaves a certain distance, we put a sack on his back and tie him back, so that we can get more money again. No, I am a man of my words. Derek refused righteously, and then said in a low voice, Check it out first, wait for Kingpin? And if he isn't here, we will find a way to tie him back, or maybe you know what, let's just do it. You are right. Huh. Wesley, who hadn't left the structure yet, felt a chill run down his spine. He felt that there were two sets of malicious eyes staring at him from behind. He quickened his pace and left the room in embarrassment, almost running. Thanks for listening to The Immortal in Marvel. This is the end of this video. Hope you enjoyed. Have a wonderful day. Thiesel and Trupter out.